Ryan, you're muted. I should know not to do that by now. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 graphic design senior thesis presentations. It's good to have you all with us, uh, students, faculty, and guests. Um, so we're going to get started um, as quickly as possible this morning, but just a couple of things I wanted uh, to mention. Um, first of all, if you could stay muted while uh, presenters are presenting um, so that they don't have any distractions. Um, there will be a, a couple of minutes for questions after each presentation is finished. Um, so jot down any notes you have or any questions you have, and you can ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, and then presenters, I will be um, giving you time warnings with these little signs. So if you could pin my video and just have it somewhere so you can see it, um, if you don't have a clock already running that you can keep an eye on. Um, and I'll hold up this one when it's time to, time to be finished. Um, but um, our seniors have put in a lot of work and a lot of effort um, to um, get their projects uh, designed, to research, to design, um, and they are really excited to share what they have uh, with you and what they've been working on this, this entire semester. So um, we'll start out with Anna. She will be giving our first presentation and then we'll just keep continue going on the schedule until we have our break, which starts at about 1015. So. All right, thanks everybody. So Anna, it's all you. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. Let me just pull up my presentation here. Can everyone see this? I need like a vocal. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's get the, the morning started. First of all, good morning, everyone. I know it's early. Um, we're going to start the morning off and talk about beer. <laughs> so. My thesis project is something that I'm very passionate about, one being branding and package design, and the second being beer, as most college kids are. <laughs> so, who is Brewery Utre? Brewery Utre is a local Kalamazoo brewery. Um, their name, Utre, is French for weird, wacky, zany, out there, but almost in a like uncomfortable way. So, Brewery Outre was founded by Ted Lineberry in 2017. Brewery Outre is currently partners with American Brewers. They are known for their, their out-of-the-box saisons, and saison is a French word for a season, and it's normally a hybrid beer containing fruity or spicy flavors, which can change seasonally depending on the ingredients. So, um, Brewery Outre kind of prides themselves on a technique called terroir. So, what exactly is terroir? Terroir is a complete and natural environment in which a particular wine is produced, including factors such as soil, topography, and climate, which basically means that Michigan can produce a plethora of ingredients for beer brewing and winemaking. So, my thesis statement. Brewery Outre's main focus is keeping ingredients locally sourced and mixing them to create wild and creative drinks. Coming into 2021, Brewery Outre needs a revamp for their new location downtown Kalamazoo, but that's a secret, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> the challenge with this design is the name of the establishment needs to match the desired aesthetic. Outre meets farmhouse contemporary. So the first bit is brainstorming. What should I be thinking about, basically? The first bit of research I did was understanding what exactly I was doing. Every company that is rebranded is dealt a little differently, so I needed to know how to exactly rebrand a brewery. I found articles at all these places. Some are more well known than others, like Pearl Fisher. The overarching theme of this research was how do you want the company to tell their story to the audience, and how are you as a designer going to make it different? Next, I did some mind mapping. I needed to visualize all my core concepts, for example, what the mission statement should be and why does Brewery Outre need a rebrand? I'll keep it on here for a minute.
So what are the goals? Other things I needed to think about is the brand positioning statement. How does Brewery Outre want to be conveyed to the public? Personality statement and core values. Who and what inspires Brewery Outre? Lastly, who's their target audience? Next bit of research was image research. The next step was to see what other people have done. Look at how the label and bottle real estate is used, how the topography and is interacting with the can in the package. After I had made my brain literally consume every bottle and label design out there, <laughs> I looked at art that really inspired me. Did I want geometric shapes or something more organic? Maybe something illustrative or completely digital. This started giving me some real good ideas about what the label could potentially look like. Lastly, I made a mood board with all of my potential ideas. Putting ideas, especially visual ideas, in one place help imagine the potential for the project at hand. Next, I literally jumped right into an interview with Ted himself. <laughs> After a lengthy discussion about both our passions for beer, we got down to business. This interview helped me learn the following. Brewery Outre strives to use local and natural ingredients to Michigan. Each beer is born and bred in Michigan. The target audience is diverse, but really seeking people who want more than just a beer. Thirdly, because Brewery Outre's ingredients are native to Michigan, it means the company is invested in not only supporting small businesses, but also taking care of Michigan's environment and agriculture. Lastly, what is the story that is trying to be conveyed? Brewery Outre is going back to beer basics, but with a twist always going back to their roots within Michigan countryside, but using local ingredients by mixing their flavor profiles to completely rock your taste buds. Lastly, I asked Ted to send me some image inspiration. He sent me some really great stuff like geometric, geometric and simplistic designs from Stillwater Brewing and some more illustrative works from smaller breweries in South Carolina. So thought process and sketching, this is when the fun stuff comes in. Logo type development. I started with comparing the word Brewery Outre with different sans serif typefaces, seeing if all caps is working or some caps, but really just seeing how the letters are laying out. Then I moved on with the same process, but with serif typefaces. Next, I started mixing and matching the serifs and the sans serifs. I wasn't really sure if I was going to like this idea, mostly because of how different it looked, but I kind of thought to myself, well, isn't that the point? Once I found a few that I liked, I started designing the accents and how I wanted the layout of the text to be. After playing with the accent for a little while, I ended up leaving it because it interacted nicely with the geometric counterforms that the sans serif type makes. I started offsetting the two words, and I liked how that looked a lot more than within a single line. I decided to settle with these two typefaces, Belo, which is a sans serif, and Belly Display, which is serif. I chose these because the sans serif is re really clean and modern, while the sans serif, while the serif type is offset because it's so heavy, almost making it uncomfortable. I decided to stay with the offset text and played with how I wanted the text to lay beneath each other. Before I made my final decisions, I wanted to lay the text out on color because my main plans with the, because of my main plans with the labels, I needed to know if it was gonna be readable on high contrast colors. After tweaking a few things, I was finally able to finish. Ta-da! <laughs> this is Brewery Outre's new look, clean, modern, but also crazy and ready to have fun. Label applications. So after getting really lost, not knowing what kind of colors to use, not knowing what kind of imagery to use, I finally got some inspiration. I started my ideas with distorting farm fields and moved my way into working with an actual map of Michigan. 
I started implementing small aspects of my digital sketches to the CAN applications. Honestly, just kind of learning the lay of the land on the CAN, basically. After a lot of critique and feedback about legibility and the overall idea, I narrowed my, narrowed my designs down to two concepts. The first one is very modern and organic with pops of color and texture. My second idea was to abstractly use the map to make forms on the can and still making it clean and modern, but not too busy. After a lot of refining and debating with cans and the abstract work, the abstract map worked better in the system while still keeping the core idea of native to Michigan, but with a twist. I added textures and patterns to make the design a little more out there, a little more outre. With that being said, I was finally ready to finish. It is now my honor to present the fresh and new Brewery Outre. So, Brewery Outre produces ales and lagers influenced by the Michigan countryside. They aim to showcase the terroir of Michigan in each glass, and also to the right, I have the brand colors. These are Brewery Outre's final product packages. Up top, we have the Lavender Saison, and then on the bottom, we have the Pinot Noir Saison. I'll leave it here for a second. <clears throat> Then we have the farmhouse ale on the top and the Sauve Blanc Saison on the bottom. I edited some of the type and the colors for this final batch to really make it stand out and continue the story of weird and wacky while still keeping it very modern. We have some close up images for everyone as well. Lastly, their website needed a huge overhaul. <laughs> On the left, we have the age restriction page, which I'm pretty sure every company that sells alcohol needs to have. And to the right, the home page, which is explaining who the company is and what the name means. Next to the left, going down the nav navigation bar, I created separate pages for the saisons, ales and lagers, and apparel and ac accessories. Lastly, I created a new contact page um, with links to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and an about page that shows how the company started and where it is located in Kalamazoo. And then here are just some applications. And I also have before and afters. So, all in all, I am incredibly proud and happy with how the outcome of my thesis. I learned that critical, conceptual, and creative thinking are truly at the base and core of all design. Moving forward, I would love to expand on the other applications that the brand could move towards. This truly became a passion project for me. And I'm so grateful I was able to go through this journey with my peers, Ryan, our professor, and Brewery Outre as a company. Thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate it. All right, thanks, Anna. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, I have a question. So, um, I've seen your thesis a couple times before and like just now I realized that the, um, the textures that you use for the can are actually the shape of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I think that that turned out super well because you kind of like extracted abstracted it by turning it. Um, mm -hmm. so I was just wondering kind of how you landed on this can design and maybe some of like your previous ideas in that process or what how you kind of landed on using you know i know it's a michigan based but how you landed on using that shape of michigan and like abstracted it for the can design 
Yeah, sure. So actually it goes all the way back to when we had that meeting with Chitra. She had um, suggested using a map to kind of see where these local ingredients were to kind of use more of a functional map on the can um, to kind of start a conversation about where the ingredients are coming from in regards to Kalamazoo. So that kind of got the ball running. And then after that, I realized that the, the shapes that it was making on the can were really interesting, but it wasn't as functional as Chitra had stated. And I liked that because Brewery Utre is all about being weird and out there and wacky. And I think kind of disforming and dysmorphing the map really kind of pushed that. So then when I did it with just the plain map, it looked really modern and super clean, um, which was one of the goals. But the other goal was to make it a little more out there, a little more crazy. So I ended up, you know, getting some patterns and some textures on there that kind of help push that a little more, if that answers your question. Yes, it does. And that's all. <laughs> All right, thank you, Anna. Yeah. Marin, you're next. Everyone see it? Perfect. Okay. Hello. My name is Marin Winter. I'm super excited today. Uh, welcome to my thesis presentation, Mind Over Endo. It is an estimate that one out of 10 individuals with female reproductive systems have endometriosis. So what is endometriosis? It is a condition in which the in which tissue similar to the lining of the uterus grows in other places of the body. Although roughly 176 million people suffer from this condition, the medical community has yet to discover the cause of and cure for endometriosis. So why focus my thesis around endometriosis? Like many others, endometriosis and infertility has affected my family for generations. And after talking to medical professionals and doing my own research, I found that there are not many places discussing the mental health aspect of having endometriosis. From my early research, I developed a thesis statement. How can design help people easily access a wide range of mental health resources when faced with endometriosis? My audience includes both the general public by creating an endometriosis and mental health campaign, as well as shifting to the endometriosis community uh, to talk about their own experiences through a community website. I want those who are experiencing pain, infertility, and any other health issues uh, because of endometriosis to know that they are not alone. The campaign is not just to educate, but to build a community and a space for those to get answers and be heard. My first goal with this project was to give those who may be struggling mentally and physically with endometriosis um, a place where others understand what they're going through. And then my second goal was to spread just general awareness of endometriosis. I began my research looking at three categories. Those were existing health campaigns, current endometriosis organizations, and microblogging, which includes applications like Twitter or Tumblr. Next, by creating a research map, I could better organize my thoughts and findings. The basis of the map was campaign and app research within endometriosis and mental health. I also noted helpful sources, whether it was organizations, articles, or any visual ideas. And then on the map, to, exp to explain it a little bit better, the dark yellow is kind of the app research, the orange is the campaign research, and the green is a combination of both, as well as I included a lot of description words just to help better understand what I want this campaign to really mean to the endometriosis community. 
In addition to the research, I created a public survey about endometriosis where I received a lot of responses after posting on my Instagram and my Facebook page. The survey gave me a better understanding of how people people feel living with endometriosis and what they want from my project. So here are just a couple screenshots from the survey. And some findings include a majority of respondents knew of endometriosis. About half of respondents knew someone who had endometriosis. About 10% of respondents were medically diagnosed with endometriosis. And that doesn't necessarily mean someone could have took the quiz and maybe thought they had endometriosis, but they just weren't medically diagnosed with it, or they haven't and don't even know of it. And then some major symptoms of having endometriosis include severe cramping, digestive issues, heavy periods, headaches, and reproductive issues. Sketching was a large portion of the project development with two potential parts uh, jotting ideas and quick illustrations helped pull together all the moving parts. Sketching included website development ideas, naming process, and any information I kind of gathered along the way, whether that was more medical based or just trying to um, research campaigns and a website sign. I then moved my process digitally. After going through many different names for the campaign, a few included on here, uh, for the companion web community website, I decided on Mind Over Endo. With promoting the mental health awareness as well as endometriosis, Mind Over Endo worked best with that idea, and it just sounds smooth as well. After landing on a name, I went through many directions for my identity. I then thought of using that pain and stress that endometriosis causes towards my idea. By slanting and dragging the type, I could better symbolize what it's like to live with endometriosis. And that moves me to the final identity, which is on the left. The type, as well as the rest of the type within the campaign is Cooper Hewitt. And then I have uh, so I'll, some alternating color ideas below the uh, identity and then on the Right side for color, I wanted to get people's attention as this is an important topic that needs to be heard. Also, the ribbon color for, en for endo is yellow. So I somehow wanted to include yellow into my color scheme. The primary colors were used within the campaign and then both the primary and secondary were used on the website. The first product of my project was posters. This is a development of one of the posters. I came up with short but strong phrases for each poster to represent the campaign. This one, find your community. Something cool about it was when I broke up community, unity still stands. And so I think that's a, a fun little thing that just happened. But uh, you can see the really, really rough sketch at the beginning and kind of how I molded it into well, the final product. So these are the final posters, which include the stress background created from pictures of dryer sheets that I tore apart, partnered with some digital line work showing this like tension between the lines. The three posters alternate the primary color scheme and the phrases replicate the style that I did the identity mark. And then the description at the bottom uh, of the bottom of their different categories that will be discussed on the website. Uh, those are to replicate the line work that I did in the background. And here are the posters together in like a street environment. I could see these both being in like an urban environment like this or in a medical clinic, doctor's office. Uh, usually doctor's offices are pretty gray. So it'd be cool to see this kind of energy and color coming from a medical campaign poster. Another print piece I developed was a postcard. The thought was having something other than those trifold medical pamphlets to be displayed at clinics or even just um, handed out at different conventions. The postcard not only talks about the campaign, but it includes a fun activity called Myth or Truth or Truth or Myth. 
And then here's a mock up of the postcard. I wanted to the front of the card to include the same aesthetic of the posters, but set it apart because it's not a poster. So I took another picture of me pulling fabrics and then I took that into Photoshop and manipulated it and then added the color that is included in the campaign. Moving to the community web page, I created six seven categories, which I mentioned earlier with the posters uh, for users to discuss. Those include mental health, everyday living, self love, intimate health, infertility, and testimonials. On here, I just also had the reasoning of why I chose those uh, for the web page. For example, mental health, I the focus it was the focus of the campaign, and then letting individuals be heard by posting what they are feeling within the category. Then wireframes were developed. The main issue was figuring out how I was going to organize the posts and then how I was going to separate the categories and then the prompts within the categories. And here are my screenshots for the final screens of each category. The first navigation is on the top and that's controlling what category you're in. And then when you change a category, it changes color. So that's when I was mentioning the secondary and primary colors, the secondary, that's how the secondary colors are used within uh, my campaign website. And then I uh, have a second navigation, which is located underneath like the write your post. And that kind of controls what uh, other pages off the community chat go to. So resources about us and notifications. Uh, the link at the bottom is to my uh, XD account to better look at the screens. And then other screens include just the login and sign up process, uh, the resource page and the about us page. To better explain how uh, all these screens work together. I made a website prototype, which I will walk through right now. So here I am logging in, but I'm also going to sign up just to show how that works. So here I'm signing up. Now I'm choosing profile picture and a username, signing up into Mind Over Endo. Here is the endometriosis plus mental health page. It first lands on, which is one of the categories. I'm liking a post. I'm looking at that category in the liked section and I'm unliking the post. I'm then changing the prompts within the mental health category to show the changes of responses. So these include the questions for users to answer. And now I'm changing the categories at the top navigation and you can see that color change. And now I'm going over to the search bar. I'm searching the word energy. I find a post that uses the word energy in it. Cool. <laughs> And now I'm going to another page. I'm going to resources to kind of show different organizations and Instagram accounts we recommend to follow. And then also the about us, which just is talking about the campaign and the website itself. Here I am writing a post and posted. To wrap up the project, I created just some social media mockups, which includes an Instagram page and then also a Facebook ad, um, and then also just a, a fun hoodie to kind of just wrap up with a bow and um, really make this campaign more of a, like a realistic thing. And so just to reflect on my project, I not only learned a lot about uh, this lifelong condition and saying endometriosis a lot, uh, but also the importance of awareness. And I'm hopeful that in the future, more medical discoveries happen and those 176 million can find that light out of that long, dark journey. Thank you. Thanks, Marin. We have some time for questions. Um, I have one. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what would you say is the kind of like the biggest snag that you ran into with this project? Because I feel like everything, you know, you have everything working together now, but I was just wondering if you had any like difficulties putting it together or like difficulties in website direction or anything like that. Yeah, um, I was stumped for a while, honestly, on the posters. I just was like, this is the idea I'm going with and this is what I'm sticking with. And then I was like trying to play around with it and I just felt like I was getting lost within designing those. Um, as well as, yeah, the website, uh, I I should have shown kind of the first page I had mocked up because it was not what it finished as. Uh, I just can figure out the layout. And then also, like I mentioned with the wireframes, trying to figure out um, how I was going to like change the categories and then also changing prompts. It was a lot of the like, moving parts within the website. To just help, yeah, try to figure out. So I would say those were the top two snags. <laughs> well, it looks great. Thank you, Jay. Um, wondering uh, uh, which of your three consultations was the most helpful to your project? Uh, it would probably be my first one because it was talking to a local OBGYN about endometriosis and that's what pushed me towards doing the mental health aspect because I originally had just endometriosis and then he mentioned about how um, because I'm from a more rural area, it's a lot more difficult for those who not who don't live in a larger city to find resources on endometriosis and mental health. So. I combined those together and tried to make something that everyone, almost nearly everyone could have access to and like find help, but also hear from other people that are experiencing the same things. So yeah, the first one. <laughs> All right, great job, thank you. Thank you. Let's see, Emma, you're next. Another round of applause. All right. Sounds right under that one. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Emma Wiest, and I will be presenting my project, The Future of User Experience in Wearable Tech. So I decided to start with a little vocabulary refresher. Um, I'm gonna be using a lot of acronyms here that might be unfamiliar to some people. Uh, essentially, my project explores the UX UI of AR, MR enabled smart contact lenses, which basically means I'm looking closely at the organization, interaction, and interface design of contact lenses that are able to project and interface onto a tiny screen contained within the lens. The environment around the user would still be visible while using the lens, and the interface will be able to recognize and interact with that environment. A user would control the interface using the movement and focus of their eyes like a mouse cursor on a computer screen. So the big question is really this. How might a designer consider, analyze, and design for the problems and opportunities brought by a new and intrusive technology while balancing innovation with the needs and comfort of the user? My primary audience is fellow designers. Um, I want everybody to start considering how this kind of technology and technologies like it um, could affect their users in the future and how they can solve unique problems ca caused by unique tech. Oops. And then my secondary audience um, is anybody who thinks this concept is cool. Um, ultimately, they're going to be the first adopters of new technology, and they'll have a say in how the project fun the uh, product functionality works. So what does the future of UX UI look like? With this project, I want to start a conversation, and these are the kinds of questions I'm hoping my audience will start asking themselves and their fellow designers. What are some considerations and implications of different kinds of technology we could be seeing in the near future? 
how do we adapt the design and organization of technology today to keep up with new software and hardware? So in my research, I, back when I was unsure what the medium I would be designing for would look like, I came across a Fast Company article on these lenses by a company called Mojo. So they are augmented reality enabled smart lenses that enhance users vision to enable the user to see something microscopically close to the surface of the eye. As soon as I saw this article, I knew I'd found my medium, but Mojo will be shipping the beta versions of these lenses in the next couple of years. So my new question became, how do I take this concept and catapult it into what might be technologically possible a decade from now? So that was the question in my head as I started building my research map. I started by generating a huge list of possible functions for these lenses, and ultimately I decided to go with functionality very similar to that of a smartwatch. The market research for smartwatches was already there. Um, I didn't really have to decide what to include because I could just pull from the most successful um, fitness trackers and smartwatches, um, so I could really focus on designing the organization and the interface itself. Um, I don't know where that photo went. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm gonna exit out and just show it like this real quick. So one of the biggest problems I set out to solve was how a user would activate, interact with, and deactivate parts of the interface using only their eyes. Mojo Lens uses a directional navigation. Their lenses are set up so that depending on the periphery you move your eyes to, a different function would appear. So moving your eyes into the upper periphery, which basically amounts to a half eye roll, you would activate a weather app. However, as soon as you moved your eyes out of that periphery, the app would disappear. The biggest issue with that is how uncomfortable it is to keep your eyes in that position for an extended period of time. I decided to organize my interface with functions on the top, right, and left periphery that when focused on would open a screen on the center of the lens. So you can move your eyes back down and have that screen stay active. That screen could then be dismissed by either shifting focus back out to your environment or by looking down to the lower periphery to exit. All right, I'm gonna try this again. Okay, so now with my general feature categories and basic control systems established, um, I started to get more specific about the people who would be using these lenses, how they came into contact with them, and what functions would be most helpful to them during their day to day. So I generated three user personas across a wider age range. Uh, my first one is Tess, representing a younger age group of early adopters. Um, next is Paula on the older end, and then Nate representing the middle age group um, and users who are concerned primarily with the exercise features. So this interaction map shows the organization and flow of all the features contained within the interface. I ultimately chose to work with three primary categories within the application area. So we have productivity, communication, and health and wellness. Um, you also see user flows here for settings and a dashboard of relevant information. For each user flow, I wanted the amount of time spent navigating to the destination um, to be as short as possible. I did my best to eliminate any unnecessary elements to make the navigation as clean as it could be. So this is the UI of my initial concept. Um, one of the biggest UI challenges was designing an interface that would be placed in an unknown and potentially high contrast environment. So I started out with an entirely white interface that used hefty drop shadows to bring a sense of depth and contrast um, and separate the UI from the environment around it. So the icons here represent different app functions um, and would appear in their respective periphery um, for a user to focus on to activate a function. So in this iteration of the UX, uh, looking left would activate settings, up for dashboard, right for apps, and down to exit if the user is already within the interface. So user testing was instrumental in my design process and helped me make decisions about usability and aesthetic. Granted, this wasn't a traditional user test. Um, I was unable to replicate the exact product experience for obvious reasons, um, but with a combination of traditional screen testing and augmented reality using Adobe Aero, I was able to roughly simulate what it could be like to use the lens. 
So after my first round of testing, I added a low opacity background to the screen to solve some contrast issues, which basically functions like wearing low tint sunglasses while you're using the interface. After the second round, I added more navigation features, including a return to last screen navigation area, which replaced the universal exit point when the user is not currently in the interface. I added back arrows to all the screens further than one step away from the menu to ease navigation. And I changed my hover state from a simple opacity change to an opacity and scale change for increased visibility. So uh, the visual part of my UI, besides what I just described, remained largely unchanged for my first version. Um, I swapped out the drop shadow for a cleaner glow, switched my typeface from Avenir to Proxima Nova for increased legibility in lowercase letters. Um, I also created an icon library, which you see at the bottom there, for use within the app screens. Um, I'm just going to click through a few images of the interface overlaid onto various environments. Um, so this is the app menu if the user were outside, the first dashboard screen at night, and the training menu inside on a sunny day. The largest refinements happened at the interaction design level. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I have some videos here. I'm going to um, reshare now if my mouse would show up. Wow, I'm full of technical difficulties today. Excuse me. I just had to click and then my mouse showed back up. That's fine. Optimize for motion and video. And reshare keynote. Okay, let's try that again. So this first video um, is for tests. You see the notification dropping down, um, the notifications tab showing up. You see the user moving into the settings area, into passive view, and then going into edit their passive view to change what they can see. Um, she switches it to high and then exits, um, and then gets up. And then this is where some of the mixed reality components come in. You can see these bubbles that start to appear um, that are attached to the buildings. And then the building information comes up um, with a restaurant name um, and ratings as well. Um, so this next video um, is based on my Paula um, user persona. So there's an, individu an individual here working, um, going up to their dashboard, over into their Today tab, um, viewing their events and reminders, going down to Exit, moving again over into Settings, into Downtime, um, turning their downtime off, um, getting distracted by something they're working on, um, using that return feature to go back to the screen that they were just in, turning their downtime back on, um, and then exiting once more. Um, and then this is how setting up a mixed reality reminder would work. So the user notices the books, moves over into apps, into productivity, um, create new event or reminder. Um, they're gonna speak, return books to the library, um, and then select that add link button um, their focus is going to shift back out to the books while that reminder appears, and then they're confirming it. Um, and then this bubble will show up to show what the reminder would look like for them to interact with in the future. And then my last video here is for Nate. Um, so they're going to move over into apps, um, going down into health and fitness, uh, moving into the training menu, and then they're going to start the workout that they have scheduled for every Friday. Um, and this is when the prompt to start comes up, um, their stats appear, and that trainer appears to lead them through their exercises. Um, and then this indicates a time shift here to the end of the workout. They see their feedback, 
Um, they see a notification bubble appearing on their water bottle, um, reminding them to drink water after their workouts are complete. So obviously there are gonna be some things that are way more difficult to do with a contact lens than they would be with a smartphone. So I decided to create a companion app that shows the level of control users would have over the interface. For example, you could shut down the lens completely inside of the lens interface, but you couldn't turn it back on. So you can also see here some other potential passive view features on the right, um, including things like calorie tracking and facial recognition that I didn't explore in these use case scenarios. Um, I also have an augmented reality component here. Um, this was originally designed as part of my user testing process, but I thought it would be fun to include to give you all a taste of interacting with the interface on your own. So if you scan the QR code with your phone, it'll take you to a link to download the Aero app if you don't already have it um, and take you to a really pared down version of my basic interface with all the first step menus. Um, so this video here is just an approximation of what you would see if you use the AR interface. And then I'll keep the QR code up as I talk about my reflection as well. Um, I learned a lot from this process. Um, it gave me the opportunity to look into the psychology behind wearable tech and how designers are solving problems in the present day. Um, I also got to really look at the philosophy of the UX process beyond the traditional web design steps. Um, I had to really understand it to be able to apply it to this new medium. Um, some questions I have afterwards, how would this look differently if I haven't found Mojo lenses and used a different medium? What other applications may be more widespread or relevant to societal issues could this technology have that I didn't explore? How could I simulate this more realistically? And finally, does it meet my goal of piquing viewers' curiosities about the future of the industry? Um, so that's all I have for today, you guys. Thank you for bearing with me through my numerous technological issues. Thanks, Emma. Great job. Um, we have some time for just a few questions. Um, I have a question. How did you record the video? Did you just use your phone or did you have like a GoPro that you used? Because your camera was like super steady when you did that. So that's actually really funny. Um, I have like exercise training bands that you're supposed to put around your legs. So I strapped my phone on top of my glasses <laughs> to simulate like what it would look like if it was actually my eyes. Um, so yeah, that was fun and kind of terrible. I had to reshoot a couple of my videos because I, it just didn't look like I was looking at it. So that was my solution. You should have included a picture of that, of what you looked like with your phone strapped to you. I have, yeah, I have a picture of it. I just, I didn't have time to talk about it. <laughs> I have a question, Emma. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Oops, sorry. If you were um, to like continue progressing this, what other stuff would you add to the lenses? Like, what would be the next thing that you'd want to add to that? That's a really good question. Um, I think I would go back to my feature list and really try to find something that would be really beneficial if it were incorporated into this technology. Um, I think like the water tracking and calorie tracking implications could be really fun to take a look at. Um, one of the things I struggled with a lot in this project was making it feel really innovative, but also not feel super big brother. So. Picking up on that a little bit. Um, when you think back to like email, when email was invented, it was supposed to save us time and then cell phones, it was supposed to save us time and have kind of immediacy and all those things were big time sucks and uh, invasive in a lot of ways. What, what kind of concerns do you have about this technology and how do you think that could be mitigated through design? Yeah, um, so I tried to, I tried to prematurely solve for a few of those issues. Um, by including a lot of customization options. Um, 
And then with the downtime as well, it would work the same as like, do not disturb on your phone. Um, I think ultimately that comes from the people and not as much from the technology and the technology is just gonna be what it is. So we have to, as designers, do what we can to help people control their urges, I guess. It's a bad way of saying it, but. All right, great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Okay, we have uh, Kendall, you're next. Okay. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay. Okay. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Kendall Willie, and today I will be presenting my thesis project, Pronto, which is an app I created for nonverbal children. So to jump right into it, what is the issue? The main issue I saw while researching this topic was that children with learning disabilities are often on the low end for prioritization in our schooling systems. So there aren't many ways to teach nonverbal children to talk except for picture cards or minimal amounts of apps. The apps that are available are hectic and hard to navigate. Because of this issue, it can easily frustrate a child if they cannot find something quickly. Apps like this can usually go for around $200, which are not usually funded through schools. So parents have to come up with another way to teach their children if their teachers are not fully able to. And here is a video of what one of those apps looks like. I want Eat blueberry. So, as you can see from it, the page can be very overwhelming to a child, especially if they are in distress. And you can also see that it takes the user through multiple pages to even get to the end result. My biggest inspiration behind this project was my little sister. She was diagnosed with autism. Autism spectrum disorder when she was two years old and is also nonverbal. Thankfully, she was able to receive services where she was given an iPad with one of these programs downloaded onto it. At 16, she still struggles to communicate, but her being able to use an app to help her speak to me, my family, or her teachers has helped tremendously. But even with the app that she uses, she can become frustrated easily if she can't find a certain button. From talking with my sister's teacher, her main issue she brought up was that the current app that the children use does not use gr grammatically correct sentences when being displayed and no separation between school and home. From this information, I learned that the way speech therapists teach children in this certain program is to use as little amount of words as possible. If a certain situation occurred and a child had to talk to a stranger, that person would not be used to the way the iPad or program talks out loud, which could become confusing. My goal with this was to create something similar to the pre previous apps where the sentences can be read out loud, but it would become grammatically correct. My intention was to make an app for these children that is easy to understand and navigate with a clean and minimalistic approach so as not to overwhelm them. And my main focus was on color and readability during this process, and my intended audience is meant for nonverbal children, parents of those children, and teachers. So what now? My inspiration relied heavily on color and how that could be used throughout, as well as simple iconography or symbols. From that point, I dove into sketching out how I wanted certain buttons to be laid out and how certain icons would look. I wanted my icons to be cohesive, so I stuck with a similar stroke weight throughout so that it would be easily identifiable. I also wanted to make things a little quirky just to bring that playfulness back into this project. Sketching these designs out helped because I was able to determine how buttons would interact and how transitions from page to page would work. Then I moved onto the computer.
After the sketching process, I started br bringing things to life. I took my hand-drawn sketches and used the pen tool and Adobe Illustrator to create my icons and the buttons. A couple examples of this step-by-step -step process can be seen with my talking person or my orange button. During this process, I saw that there were a couple icons I had to refine to make them look like the real thing as much as possible. An example of this would be my pancakes button. I went from a plain stack to adding syrup to them just to show that the smallest changes can make the biggest differences. Afterwards, I was able to come up with a color system where pronouns were orange, actions were navy blue, rooms were mint, people were pink, and activities were green. And then from this, I developed my color palette that I would use for certain design elements throughout the screens. And then next came with naming the app. I went through a few options, them being Pronto, Zap, Snappy, or Blink. Um, I came up with names that had to do with quickness and getting to the end result as fast as possible, since that was the main point behind this project which led me to the name Pronto, which I put in hatch bold italic. This name seemed to be the easiest option out of the group so that a nonverbal child would be able to vocalize the name if need be. It was the most interesting out of them. I came up with the slogan tap to talk to emphasize what that product does, which I put in pearlucent light. And then the words on each button are an Arbotech like light rounded. Listening to feedback on my early designs, I was able to collect insight that I needed to work on readability issues, whether that be the opening screen after logging in on the left or the main home screen like on the right. The issues I ran into with the icons slightly disappearing on the page or color issues throughout. I was then able to make my icons with a fill instead of a stroke just so that it was able to stand out better and so that a child would be able to recognize what the item was as fast as possible. The color issues I ran into were making all the buttons the same color. I realized at this point I need to make each button a color associated with that item. An example of this could be making the grapes button purple or the apple button red. If there weren't any easy identifiable colors associated with a button, I came with came up with the closest option I could. They need to be multicolor or represent what that item was so that it was easier for the child to find that item and differentiate them from the others. So with many, many hours later, Pronto was born. Once revisions were made, I was able to make my end result, which consists of many screens that can be navigated through the program Adobe XD. Example of this would be my login screen when you first open the app and the main page separating school and home. And then here are some of the other pages that you would see throughout while using the app. And then here is a video of me walking through it. I would like to eat blueberries. I would like to eat blueberries. Sorry, everybody. What just happened? Oh boy. One second, everybody. <laughs>
I would like to watch Peppa Pig. I would like to watch Peppa Pig. I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. Okay, so hopefully um, with what you saw and not dealing with the technical issues, um, once you download the app, you'll be required to enter in an email and password, whether that be a personal email that the parents have or one that is assigned to their children through schools. From that point, you have the option between home and school. I had this option due to certain items not being available to the children while at school like they could have at home. As you touch each word, it is read out loud in a grammatically correct sentence to mim mimic a person actually speaking. And the child has the option of either tapping on the talking person icon that I made or the white bar um, to read the sentence out loud again as a whole. I also have an add food option so that each screen is customizable for each child. I also added a back button so that it was easy to go back to the main page. And by pushing on the school or home icon in the lower corner, it takes you to the page if you want to switch in between the two. A difference between home and school is having the options to do more activities based on what the child likes, including TV shows. And then examples of some similarities between the two would be the foods page or basic necessities like having to go to the bathroom. From this point, I made a mock-up to show what the app would look like on the home page of an iPad. For this, I want to keep it simple, but also playful. So I use the P from Ponto and incl included colors used throughout the app indicated by the dots. I also made a few promotions that can be seen on school's home pages for parents and teachers to see if they wanted to download. and sponsored ads that can show up on a person's Instagram feed. So overall, this project has taught me to see things from a different perspective, to trust the process, know that mistakes will be made, um, but to be extremely patient with it. Communication can come easy to some, and this app be a helpful step in the right direction for them. And that is Pronto. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Great job. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm wondering if you showed this to your sister and what she thought, if anything, about it. You know, me living like two hours away, it is kind of hard to go back and forth. Um, so I have not had a chance to show it to her, unfortunately. Um, but I think she's able to pick up on things easy. So I think she would be able to figure it out. Um, pretty fast. Um, <clears throat> what do you think sets this this app apart from other apps that are already out there for kids? Um, I mean, from the pictures and video that I showed, like you can see that even once you first open it, it can be like really crazy um and i didn't want that from the beginning um and i think just making it like that playful aspect um but also like be able to read things easy as well
All right, thanks, Kendall. Oh, anyone have a question? All right, so Alexis, you're next. All right, can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Okay, so hi, my name is Alexis Swan, and I'm happy, happy to introduce the Plant Protection Foundation branding and poster design process. When choosing a topic for my thesis, I knew I wanted to do something I was passionate about. And as a houseplant fanatic, I naturally gravitated to plant protection awareness. I soon found the growing plant poaching issue, which involves the illegal removal of rare and endangered species from their natural habitats. After researching the problem of plant poaching, I knew that the plants need protection from the black market demand for illegal smuggling. Thus, coming up with the Plant Protection Foundation, a nonprofit designed for awareness and education in order to carry out the goal of plant protection. Plant smuggling has been an overlooked problem for quite some time, and many species have been endangered and wiped out. I've decided for the species to focus on that come from four different regions of the continental United States. The first being the Dudleya. There are 47 species of Dudleya and 26 of them reside on Northern California cliffs. Half of these species are rare and listed as threatened and endangered. Some of these specimens can be found at 100 years old and are sold for thousands. This is a size that recent legally propagated plants cannot reach in a timely manner. And Besides the endangerment aspect, the environment gets impacted as well. When uprooted from the cliffs, the surrounding land becomes unstable and promotes erosion. The next targeted species is the carnivorous Venus flytrap. The natural environment for this species is incredibly small, covering only a 47 mile radius. And this is in North Carolina. They are found in swamps and bogs. The loss of natural habitat for the species has made them more rare than ever. The lack of attention and the declining population is a factor to the continuation of poaching. Illegally poached plants can be identified by weeds, sand, and size variety in pots. The living rock cacti is found in Big Bend National Park in Texas. This slow growing species is known for their unique structure and lacks thorns. It's believed that 10 to 15,000 of these specimens were sold overseas through eBay. The people that are willing to risk jail time gather as many cacti as possible for large profit. After being smuggled in large plastic garbage bags, many rot and don't reach consumer hands. Lastly, orchid poaching is an illegal activity that dates back to the Victorian era, and it still takes place today. Endangered and rare species of orchids are taken from their natural environment for personal collections. After being tracked onto their habitat, they're sold on the black market. This being said, the careless act of plant poaching for the black market creates a ripple effect of withering native and vital species to extinction in the wild, thus damaging the delicate balance and diversity in local ecosystems. The Plant Protection Foundation will inform consumers how to avoid buying illegally harvest plant, harvested plants and therefore protect, represent, and conserve. My posters will be displayed in botanical gardens where plant lovers and eco-friendly consumers can be educated on the ethics of plant sales. After consultation, I was told that this subject needed more recognition and approaching it at locations such as this was appropriate as well. Pictured are entrance trail photos to Naples Botanical Garden where the designs will be placed so that it is the first thing that guests see while beginning their walk. The intended message is to emphasize the urgency that plant species are greatly impacted by unethical black markets and consumers can make a difference on the demand and the safety of the plants by being aware of what products are legally and illegally sourced and why it matters. This would ultimately create a decline in demand and therefore the audience can be educated and not let their green thumbs leave a print on the environment. After viewing the pieces, the goal is that my audience will take a more conscious and ethical approach to purchasing plants for their collection and ultimately make a positive impact on the targeted species 
and their environment to protect, represent, and conserve them. Plants are the foundation of ecosystems, and the Plant Protection Foundation is the foundation of conservation. My research consisted of figuring out the targeted species within the continental United States, how they were impacted, why there was a demand for them, and who was connected to the issue. Throughout COVID, there has been a spike in overall houseplant purchases due to trends and social media influence. This led me to a discussion with local plant shop owners. I came to the conclusion that the problem was larger than expected. Due to regulations and propagation resources, a vast majority of businesses come across standards and laws to prevent illegal activity. However, uneducated collectors and fanatics spend thousands online to purchase larger species than the ones found in shops that have taken years to get to the preferred size. These targeted species are sold on the black market, disregarding the environmental impact. I then decided to collaborate with protection programs, professors, and botanical gardens to reach a wider green thumb audience that may be uneducated on the subject and that care about the urgency of the matter. While starting the design process, I visited Naples Botanical Garden and I photographed many species to understand the garden's goal, as well as gain resources about the plants, their importance, and their unique forms. I also used my thumbprint as a more physical device to use in my designs and driving my promotion saying, don't let your green thumb leave a print. I used the print textures as a key representational component in my poster designs. I look for inspiration in many areas, the main area being propaganda. I noted center alignment, bold type, minimal palettes, strong forms, emotion, and message. The message was straightforward and spoke to the viewer with urgency. I also looked at propaganda as a starting point for influence on the structure, composition, and type treatment for my posters, including informational, informational and statistical elements that I wanted shown in a more visual manner. My initial sketches were geared in an approach where I wanted to catch the audience's eye with something beautiful. I used my photography references to pull a variety of certain macro plant forms and pair them into a composition with type that harmonized while maintaining hierarchy. I then took the direction further and I pulled what was successful from previous sketches into more intriguing compositions with certain motifs and contrasts that led the eye in a meaningful and logical way for the audience. I also introduced the beginning color palette. Although the posters were visually interesting, after a critique with fresh eyes, I realized it lacked the needed urgency of the matter, so I moved in another direction. I pulled back in propaganda type wording and I paired it with disappearing and victimizing feeling with the form composition. Hence the representation aspect in my thesis statement. This way it made the plant seem more personable and hopeless and running out of time to be saved, driving the goal of urgent consumer action and change in habit. I also worked with usage of negative space and minimal color as an effective way to communicate. While branding my foundation, I wanted to represent the plants in the overall purpose of creation of the Plant Protection Foundation. There is a lot to represent, so I decided to go with the most recognizable plant form of the Dudley succulent and use an abstract approach for the purpose and effect on the environment and species. Here I searched for something that reflected the poster series purpose. I went in a direction that represented the plants, but also the ripple effect that they have on the environment and emphasize the importance of targeted species because there is more than what meets the eye and quite literally digging deep beneath the surface where the roots hold the surrounding plant in place to maintain order and peace. While creating the logo, I also needed the subject to be recognizable and not mistaken as a flower, but more so the leaves of the plant and its energy where photosynthesis occurs and promotes growth. The results of the logo took a lot of careful experimentation with color and type as the elements needed to coexist in a complementary and balanced fashion so they did not compete and felt unified. I decided to keep colors to a minimum in order to show movement and a ripple effect and the energy that the plant produces to the surrounding environment. The order of the color was assembled and designed to put emphasis on the plant as well as strengthen the mark on lighter platforms. 
Alternate versions of the mark show switching color order to maintain a hierarchy to the logo and to keep the forms visible in dark backgrounds. Bottom right shows an alternate type arrangement for application. The poster series represents the urgency in the plant poaching matter and call to action while focusing on the species disappearance, but also in the impact on the environment while using thumbprints as a texture within the plant forms to symbolize the reason behind the problem. The color choices were designed to contrast the intended environment while keeping the electric colors for emphasis on the energy that is being dispersed throughout each composition. The feeling of urgency was a critical factor in the success of the designs to accurately represent the need of conservation for each species. By combining this plant at the center of attention and treating type as part of the form, the poster can communicate a feeling of intriguement to learn more about the posters and the foundation. A QR code can be found at the bottom right of each poster. As stated previously, the series will be displayed at the front entry pathway to the botanical garden to attract caring people interested in the better, betterment of the environment and targeted species. Here people can gain knowledge and appreciation for the plant life. A memento of plant Plant tags are a great way to promote the foundation and give responsible consumers pride in their conscious house plant purchases. The tags stick out from the plants and are conservation conversation starters to spread awareness to other potential plant owners. In addition, relevant ads can be dispersed in social media that are relevant to viewer feeds and trends for po possible interest in plants and environmental topics. Social media influence has had a large impact on buying patterns throughout quarantine. By finding this source, advertisements may help the large audience get educated on the subject. The Plant Protection Foundation website is also a great resource to gain information behind responsible purchasing and education on plant poaching impacts for both the species and their natural habitat. The site includes a mission statement, the designed icons for each species, and their information. The Plant Protection Foundation website is a simple design so that information is easily accessible and details include how to notice potentially smuggled plants with distinct differences from pro propagated specimens. As a reflection, I have found that the importance of research on the audience for specific problems, how to convey certain feelings through forms, understanding the subject as a perspective resource, and how layers of representation can influence meaning on a deeper level to be more effective. Thank you for your time and don't let your green thumb leave a print. Thanks, Alexis, great job. Um, we have time for a few questions. I have a question. Uh, I was yeah. wondering if you found out who the biggest perpetrators of plant poaching are. Like, is it mostly private sellers or does it sort of expand into bigger retail stores too? They're mostly private um, sellers and plant collectors are a big thing. Um, they're mainly exported to like places in Europe and Russia and also China, but it depends on the species. Um, mostly cactuses have been imported to Germany especially saguaro cactuses in the recent years. So it really depends on the demand for each species. Cool, thanks. All right, thanks. Um, Bianca, you're next. All right. Oops. Is that 
that should have been it. Okay. All right, can you guys see that? Cool. All right, so I'm Bianca Mazaraka, and this is my thesis presentation. Um, thank you for everyone's time today, real quick. Um, I did my uh, presentation on a brand I created called B. It is for adolescent menstruation. So who menstruates? Um, anyone with a uterus and ovaries goes through menstruation. I learned uh, doing a lot of research that there are a lot of problems that come, uh, a lot of problem areas that come with menstruation, uh, like how people view the topic, uh, people's lack of knowledge on the topic, um, some other aspects like uh, pink tax, and just a lot of things that menstruation um, are a lot of problems that people don't normally think of when they first think of menstruation. Um, but what really caught my attention was when I found out that adolescents are starting their cycle as young as eight years old. Um, so why adolescent menstruation? If that wasn't wild enough to you, um, I had to really figure out why I wanted to focus on this topic. Um, I knew that menstruation was something that I was really interested in and passionate about, but I had to ask myself why first. So um, doing a little Digging deep, um, I kind of found out that it had a little bit of a personal connection. Um, I started my period when I was eight years, uh, 10 years old, sorry, not eight. Um, and I was always kind of like progressing a little bit faster than my friend group. So when I turned to my friend and said, hey, do you have a pad? And she looked at me like, I know what that is, but why do you need one? It was like, a really uncomfortable feeling and even though someone was there I felt lonely um, especially for a 10 year old so it was a really nerve-wracking situation and I think just kind of having that feeling um, stick with me and then doing research and figuring out what other people go through and how they're feeling unprepared um, I wanted to make something that was a that would allow people to feel good about this topic um, even though there's situations that can be kind of bad, uh, I wanted people to try to feel good and look for the positive in it. So um, my thesis statement was to create a brand that could comfort young adolescents during their period, giving them the resources and products they need to feel prepared for their cycle. I first started uh, researching what was out there because if you look at a lot of uh, menstruation products right now, they're very um, feminized. <laughs> they're definitely marketed towards women, which is understandable, um, normally associated with uteruses and ovaries. But um, talking to a couple people and some consultations, it was brought to my attention that um, we're in the 21st century and even a seven or even an eight year old um, might not identify with their gender. So um, there's gender dysmorphia and um, just kids not identifying um, with that gender. So I wanted something to um, kind of feel a little bit for, um, I wanted it to feel inclusive. So um, I didn't want to just make it very feminized. I wanted my product to be a little bit more fun. So um, like I said, just seeing what's out there and how it's very pink and red and um, some of it even feels a little bit adultish. Um, so I wanted something to comfort the young adolescents and feel fun, um, but without talking down to them. So other outside resources that I looked at were just kind of like some games um, and just other interests other than um, hygiene products because I figured they have other interests than just uh, what's designed for uh, hygiene. So I thought that would be a good place to kind of expand some uh, different design uh, aspects. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, after gathering kind of my different areas and looking at what's out there and um, doing my research, I was in the early sketching phase and I was really at first kind of in the going towards the direction of making a product 
or designing some sort of product um, that would kind of indicate when someone's on their period. So if the adolescent didn't want to communicate that they're uh, on their cycle right now, maybe it's something that they left out on the counter and everyone at home would kind of know what that is. But the more and more I kind of did that um, and worked with that idea, it seemed like I was getting a little bit further from what was actually my purpose and um, that I want people to feel comfortable with the topic and if they're kind of hiding it to show that they're going through it, uh, it kind of didn't make sense to me after a while. So uh, getting those early ideas out, um, I started to kind of create uh, an identity and um, some different sketches for a brand. I, uh, I tried a couple of different types and I was going with these kind of like faces, um, either fun shapes, something fun, bold, um, some bright colors, but not too crazy. Um, and you, like I said, then I was kind of working with these faces. Uh, personally, didn't care for them, but they definitely started to get the wheels turning in what was going to be my final design. Um, so moving on with sketches, I also created some textures that I got really excited about. Uh, these are just a few of them. I ended up turning them black and white to work with them, but I thought showing them in color was kind of fun. Um, these I was really excited about. Like I said, I wanted to find a way to incorporate these. And luckily I did because I kind of thought they still played off of like that um, child, like playful aspect, but not, like I said, talking down to them and um anything too direct so using those scans and those faces i kind of started to incorporate them um i wasn't really a fan of what was over here on the left i thought it was fun but it just wasn't what i personally liked and then uh, i started to kind of create these forms and uh, get a little bit feedback on those and how those are kind of a little bit more fun and active and maybe something that uh, adolescent could kind of relate to a little bit more, just like moving around, um, trying to have a good time. So uh, incorporating the scans, the forms and some graphics, uh, the graphics, the little graphic elements seemed a little too strong and kind of the scans that I had the textures in this composition on the right or yeah <laughs> so um moving on with that I redefined my or yeah I redefined my forms and I settled or I picked the type um Urbana for my type yeah uh, I used I called it B um so my product is B and here are my figures and this is my color palette uh, i have a wide range of colors um very bright i think looking at it here it's kind of a lot but when it's broken down into the system i think it's uh, it comes together very nice so using some applications or applying this to some applications uh, i started to create boxes for the products that i wanted this brand to offer so these are just some flat sketches to show just kind of how i applied the scans the forms and then my colors um, i also have some words on the inside just kind of some nice affirmations um, little surprises i would say for this product um, i wanted to play a lot off of like a surprise on the inside so I think having this very simple um, outside kind of helps play off of that. When you open the box, it's very fun on the inside. Um, I wanted to kind of recreate the pattern tampon packaging also. I thought uh, that there could also be a place to kind of have that little like awe moment um, when you open it. Why can't there be something a little bit nice in there to make you feel good? So just kind of adding those words where I can and um, textures and anything to make it a little bit more fun and playful. Um, here are my tampons, my tampon application, uh, having those words. So when you kind of like pull it out, it says B and then you have a nice little word there. Uh, this is for a menstrual cup um, and this shows what I have at the bottom of my boxes. I just have like those nice little words so that when they're empty or when they're at the end, um, just something to make them feel good, even though they've got to get more. <laughs> um, and then an envelope box that I used for period, or I'm sorry, a pillowcase box. 
um, that I used for period underwear and applying my um, designs on the inside of that and using a band to wrap around the underwear for my um, forms because in my on my boxes, I apply them around the inside box. So I wanted to still use them and have them be visible in this one. Um, and then I created a first time box. So this one is white because I really wanted it to be a surprise. Um, and when you open it, you get a sample of pads, tampons, and then there's this little note card on the inside. Um, this note card would uh, either be a first time note card or a second time note card. That's what I use the colors to different, differentiate. Um, the first time note card, you would get a little, it shows you a little um, menu kind of of what's offered on the uh, website through um, the company and then the QR code takes you to the website homepage. On the back, just a little bit about the company and a helpful tip. Um, so this is if you've already subscribed before, I thought you could still get a card um, and this QR code would take you to your subscription page if you've already used me a couple of times before. And um, this one just has a little bit more helpful tips for you. So, um, so it's useful. And then I created a website. So this was just some wireframing that I did for it. And here are a couple screens. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm going to show my video real quick. Um, well, actually, my video was kind of acting up. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to walk you through this real quick. Um, can you guys see this all right? Okay, so this is my website B. Um, you can click through the top and it's a nice little banner. Um, just a little bit more about B and how they want to make you feel good. A little uh, taste of kind of like the products that are offered. Um, just to kind of show a little bit of like my target audience. Um, and then when you scroll down, it shows you um, those illustrations that I have kind of on the menu of the products that are offered. Um, a little bit more about B and how just a brand that wants to help and make you feel good. Um, subscribe today and you can get your box. Um, scroll up to the top and if you want to shop, you can um, view the products. Um, and then I even have like a little bag down here. But if you click on the product, you're able to um, change the color if you want, because I think giving them kind of the choice of that is nice, but then also just kind of view the different products. And then um, if you go to your profile, this is where you would find um, your subscription. So this is kind of like your information uh, where you're getting things subscribed to or sent to. Um, and then down here is like your box for the May, the month that's coming. Um, this person ordered two boxes of tampons and a box of pads and their next refill is coming in August. But if they want to skip that or change that, they can. So that is my website B. Um, my, <laughs> oops. And then, yeah, just my reflection. Um, I learned, especially with a project like this, um, it takes, oops, some time um, to kind of see some stuff. I felt like I was really stumped at first and um, not really like, like I was coming to class with stuff, but not really like getting anywhere. Um, and then it it just took a while to kind of um, have some progress um, show, I think, because I was trying to come up with a final concept so soon. So I think just kind of like letting the work speak for itself eventually. Um, and then just kind of like how I could further this, I think using an app um, could be something interesting, but I wanted to kind of have it have this product differentiate from what's out there um, in terms of like products, but also I didn't do something like um, a period tracker because a lot of those out there are already really, really nice. Um, so if there was some sort of extension that B could have um, is something that I was kind of like thinking out yeah, thinking on and reflecting. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, I think I'm a little over time. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so that that's what I have. That's my senior thesis. This is B, um, adolescent menstruation. So thank you, everyone.
Thanks, Bianca. Great job. Um, questions for Bianca. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about the, the first time versus second time box. Um, did the first time box have like every kind of like period preparation, like the underwear, the cup? Um, do you customize your own boxes then? Do you kind of get to like pick what's in them? Yeah, oh, so I was thinking for the first time box um, because I'm sure maybe menstruation is new to adolescents at a young age. Um, they might not know exactly what they want to use right off and so I figured if I was able to send them um, two of the products, they could test out. And if one works for them, then they kind of uh, it leads into the other one, I think. So they have a little bit more of a sense of how the other two work. They are able to pick um, if they want to keep buying tampons and pads, they're more than welcome or if they can subscribe to get the underwear and cup. So yeah, they have the choice, but this is just to kind of um, try the product out at first and see what works for them. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank yes. you, everyone. Next, we have Nicole. Okay. Oh, wrong thing. Okay. Um, Hello, my name is Nicole Weaverich, and today I will be presenting to you um, my app, Spice Cabinet. So for this, um, I am an aspiring home chef. I have been cooking for several years, and I really wanted to dive into spices and herbs, but I didn't know where to start. Um, I had all these spices. Um, that were in my cabinet, but I never knew how to blend them or even enhance the flavor of my dishes. And I would look online and I'd find recipes and I just follow the recipe, but I didn't understand how to, you know, enhance it when it came out bland. Um, so for my thesis statement, I wanted to create an app where I could you know, have it on hand and easily, um, you know, learn how to cook with herbs and spices. Um, my young audience or my audience is like 18 to 30 year olds um, or anyone who just wants to learn how to enhance the flavor of their dishes. Um, I found that a lot of people are actually intimidated by herbs and spices. Um, and so I thought it would be a uh, just a, a neat idea. Um, my goals for this app are to understand um, how to combine herbs and spices and how, um, like, uh, how I can enhance recipes and um, just, you know, it entice people to explore past the recipe. Um, so that they have more confidence um, in in um, exploring. Um, for this project, I had to start out with an image map. Um, I wanted to figure out what the main points for my thesis are, um, which is the main features of this app. Um, I dove really deep into my research and I learned a lot about herbs and spices that I never knew before. Um, and so while I was doing that, I really wanted to um, kind of ex um, be experimental and um, uh, be adventurous. So for um, the first idea I had was Sabre. Um, and I wanted to 
give it that homemade aspect or handcrafted aspect that um, what feels like when I cook at home. Um, and uh, so I was looking into different um, spices, like a, with different um, fonts, and I decided I wanted to move away from the fonts and try to work on um, like creating my own. Um, and so the the S here that I have on the in the second row um, on the right was an inspiration for the the logo logo over here. Um, the one on the the left is was inspired by sauces. Um, and then um, I tried to add a threshold of texture. Um, so that it would bring in that spice aspect. Um, it still felt kind of flat, so I added different colors, but it still wasn't working for me. Um, and this was where I got with the logo. Um, I, I didn't like it. I knew it needed something more, but I kept the idea of the colors here. Um, and so I went back to um, what I call a where I keep all my spices, which is a spice cabinet. And I looked at different logos and decided I was going to combine the word spice and cabinet. And then for that leaf um, that is above the eye in spice, um, I took the image of a bay leaf and I put this. Um, spice rainbow texture uh, to kind of give it that, um, you know, the mild to spicy, um, just to give it that range of flavors. And this is what I decided on for my final logo. Um, I gave it the green background to, you know, really pop it and um, give it a fresh, a fresh feeling. Um, and while I was doing my research, I kept coming back to, to to a question. I have these spices, what can I do with them? And I have these ingredients, um, what can I spice? What can I um, put a spice with? So like chicken. Um, and uh, so I created two different layouts. I realized both layouts were very, very similar. Um, so I narrowed them down to one um, and this is when I was still working with the Saver logo. Um, I really fleshed out the um, the wireframes here. Um, I added a lot of information, and um, it it seemed it was going pretty good. Um, but then once I ha I had to start working, or I had to. Um, I decided about the logo change because it didn't saver wasn't working. Um, and then I really, uh, I had to, um, I had to reorganize the, the logo a bit because it, it, um, I had to reorganize the app too, because the logo took longer than I was expecting, but I did bring out, um, a lot of the, the, um, the app more. Um, and then this is the final layout I have for the app. And I actually wanted to take you guys on a tour of how this app flows. So I'm going to get out of here for a second and go here. Um, so I'm going to log in. And then this is the screen you'll, you'll be presented with first. Um, I'm going to go with what spices I have. So I want to pick garlic powder. And I want to do cumin and I'm going to hit this next button here. And then from here, I want to be able to select. I'm going to select this. And so, right here, I have everything here, but I don't have chili powder. This icon here will pop up a menu for chili powder. If you have the spices, um, and then you can create your own chili powder and continue on with your recipe. Um, so I'm going to get back out of here and then I'm going to go down to my recipe section here. 
And this is where you can search different recipes. Um, and it doesn't have to be limp. You know, you don't have to go off what's in your spice cabinet. This is more like where you can see what other. Um, you know, what other uh, recipes are available. And if you go into here, you'll have your saved recipes. Um, and you can even. Uh, um, create a new 1, um, so you just have to hit these here and. Um, it will uh, allow you to enter in your own. Um, and then this is your spice cabinet where you have uh, all your collection spices. And then this marker here is to let you know that you have a spice that's expiring. Um, spices generally have a shelf life of three to nine months. And when they expire, they just lose their flavor. Um, so this is just a reminder when you should replace your spices. Um, and then here is an area where if you wanted to dive more into um, learning about spices and herbs, you can click on these and um, it'll dive into, you know, how to blend spices, um, infusions and ways to dry your herbs um, if you want to learn more about working with them. And then oh, up here, um, we have a profile where um, you can adjust your household and with the recipes, um, it will um, adjust to um, your household or how many people you're working with. Um, and then, uh, you know, you just have your um, sections. And so this is um, the app Spice app and um, going um, back here. Oh, wrong place. Um, going back to my keynote. Um, just for uh, the reflection, um, I realized that, you know, maybe I took on a lot, but I did have a lot of fun doing it. Um, and uh, I uh, do want to continue working on this app after. Um, there are areas I didn't, um, I do want to explore more on. So um, that that's, that's a spice app. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, Nicole. Great job. Um, questions for Nicole about her projects? What sort of uh, dishes have you expanded into once you've uh, started putting this app together? Like, after doing all the research of how you can turn ingredients into other ingredients, have you sort of explored with that in your own kitchen? Um, oh, yeah, I've been doing that all semester. Um, I've been experimenting with different chicken recipes a lot. So, like, um, I've made like chicken broth. Um, I've made, um, like, um, I've done a lot with like baking chicken. Um, just like in like putting different herbs on top of that. Um, I've been experimenting with. Um, sauces and putting spices into that. Um, I've been, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I like the other day I messed up a chicken Alfredo and I decided, well, it's, you know, I got to figure out how to, how to, you know, work with it. So I looked up a recipe and I, I, I fixed or I adjusted it and I made it, um, to my taste, um, it's, I've, I've been a lot of like, it's been a lot of like mistakes in the kitchen and then figuring out how to um, uh, like rework it and maybe even make it taste better than what it was before. Um, so I've done that with just friends, but also with myself. Um, I, I just couldn't put it all in the app. <laughs> I, have, I have a question. 
um, when you when you uh, did you do your own food photography after you made dishes, or did you get things from you know other sources? I got things from other sources because I didn't. I, I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind to take food photography. Um, but I can definitely like work on this after like college and I can definitely put in my own because I do want to expand on this. Um, I had a lot of fun doing this project. Um, so I definitely do want to, um, take my own food photography too. Um, well, I just know that food photography is, is really difficult because sometimes way you light it doesn't look like what it's supposed to be. I just was curious if you were interested in tackling that at some point or other. Yeah. Oh, I think it would be fun to do that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Christian, you're next. Okay. Okay, my name is Christian Heiler, and here I'll be presenting my 2021 graphic design thesis. Um, the problem at hand, um, how can we make something that's visually uninteresting, such as a garbage truck or a bin, and kind of have it, you know, be something designed to be a little more elaborate and a little more eye-catching? So my thesis at hand, the lack of appeal that garbage trucks and bins have is something that we all pick up on, but not necessarily given much attention to. Most trucks are a solid color with the company's logo stamped on the side and the bins aren't too far from that design as well. We're now seeing trains, city buses, and you know other forms of transportation being designed with interesting patterns of wraps. So why not bring a new breath of air to the exterior of these vast forms of machinery? Just because something may contain trash doesn't mean that it has to look that way. And this will not only beautify the trucks itself, but the city as city of Flint as a whole. My essentials are to normalize specialty designs on garbage trucks and bins to generate an appeal to these forms of art on wheels. So for my thesis project, the target audience is uh, members of the community and um, probably members as well of city council. The message that I'm trying to convey or get across is that just because something may hold something of you know, lesser value, doesn't mean it has to look that way. If we took some time to observe things in our environment, then um, we could take some, of the most unappealing things, you kind of give it a new meaning. So with that being said, um, I wanted to start my research with um, kind of looking at different forms of transportation, like I mentioned earlier, and how they kind of use these uh, full exterior body wraps. So we have here um, a metro. Um, next image is just this um, semi that has this water tank, and there's so many more different um, forms of uh, transportation such as aircrafts and stuff like that, um, city buses, you know, just to name a few. So that's kind of the direction that I wanted to lean in as far as, you know, a full body wrap and stuff like that. So beginning my research, I wanted to take a look at um, the evolution and um, kind of the history of garbage trucks and garbage bins itself over the course of years and um, kind of taking a look at the, the design and how everything kind of um, progressed over the years and stuff like that. So as you see, um, nothing too different from what we're, you know, used to seeing now as far as the look of the trucks and bins itself, you know, it's kind of just this one um, color and then um, that's pretty much it. So nothing, you know, special, nothing eye-catching anyway. So this currently is the current design or for lack of better terms, uh, current design that Flint has as far as its um, waste management goes and stuff like that. So it's just a red truck and literally just says city of Flint sanitation on the side. So beginning my sketches, I um, wanted to um, kind of take different areas of Flint as the inspiration behind the designs itself. So Flint being my, um, my uh, home city and stuff like that, I wanted to, um, take that um that aspect and kind of um uh, like i said take different portions of flint and kind of showcase different landmarks maybe here and there or kind of show members of the community being communal 
or um, different events that uh, Flint, you know, showcases as far as like back to the Bricks events and um, different organizations like the uh, Boys and Girls Club and um, different, um, probably like different highlights of sports around town and um, things like that. So here are just a couple hand sketches that I've done over the process. Next is kind of my mood board that I had to map out. Um, here is just taking imagery of garbage trucks and garbage bins, um, as you've seen before. And then I also have images above those that kind of um, kind of generate this buzz of and different feeling that I was trying to go with. So I have here a couple images of different in, environmental graphics and stuff like that. That was the direction and that I was kind of headed with with my designs. And I also have images of um, different time periods of Flint. So I have some images of this whole sit down strike in the Chevy and the whole there. I have a couple, you know, newer images of people downtown gatherings. And then also have a couple images over there um, at Wood Stadium. So the backstory behind my designs, I wanted to take images from the past that it will kind of um, take our minds off the whole water crisis that Flint is so known for. So um, I was going back to the drawing board and kind of thinking of different ideas and different aspects of Flint's history and stuff like that. And it brought me to the whole sit down strike at the, um, one of the plants and stuff like that. So Chevy in the Hole was situated in the Valley of Flint and it um, had over like 20 plus factories back then. And um, they made automotive parts for GM. So here is an image, as you see different factories and stuff like that. And then um, around 1936 is when this whole sit down strike began. And basically uh, workers weren't getting um, paid right. Um, work conditions were Poor and horrible and stuff like that. So eventually people want to go on strike and protest that. So here are images and stuff like that that kind of speak to that. Um, so with this slide, I kind of just want to show the past and the present and how we, you know, evolved as a community and stuff like that. So here again, I kind of have the images of the whole sit down strike. You see members kind of passing food along as they were kind of staked out in the factories and stuff like that as you see people are counting down the days and stuff like that so with that being said starting my whole design process i wanted to have this foreground middle ground background when it comes to the designs and the foreground would be more design elements uh middle ground will kind of host more so typography in the background will include photography um, kind of basically just going on what I said. Two main subjects will be typography and photography that I was kind of focused on with my designs. And so um, during my uh, process, I kind of wanted to experiment with uh, image um, treatments. So here I have like halftone patterns, color gradients, cropping, duo tones, just trying to um, kind of break up the norm when it comes to image um, treatment and stuff like that, because I didn't want to just have a plain image in the background that just rest back there that had no meaning. So um, this was me kind of just experimenting with design elements that um, can kind of kind of go around in the foreground of um, my different designs. So here I kind of have like the Flint City uh, skyline. Um, I kind of have these uh, trees and um, clouds to kind of bring this whole environmental aspect, excuse me, environmental aspect. And then I kind of have these um, rounded strokes and different little curves here. So moving on through my exploration, um, here are some different ideas and different avenues that I went through through the process and um, just different layouts. Me um, trying to communicate the whole past and the present by bringing in both images from the past, example A, and then images from the present, example B. So that led me to my final designs. Um, the top design, I just wanted to kind of um, bring in the bedrock theme a little more. So bedrock is kind of a known, I would say a word that kind of Flint people can reside with. Um, with us being a Flint, we're kind of known as the Flintstones. You know, Flintstones were, um, they lived in bedrock. So that was a kind of a prominent name with us. So um, the second one 
the design I was trying to go for was more of a communal aspect and just kind of a, this more friendly approach with the more lighter vivid colors and um, also have in the background the Flint Vehicle City um, arches that kind of hover over the downtown area that people are you know, can reside with and stuff like that. Those are actually kind of built around the same time as the whole sit down strike that I kind of mentioned before. Uh, the bottom design, I kind of wanted to showcase the past and the present. So I have this um, image of this young lady. She's actually a child advocate for Flint with like the whole water crisis. So her face is very known around town. And then I also have this image of this um, this younger uh, looking fellow, um, probably probably in the same time frame as the whole sit down strike and stuff like that. So with this design, I kind of wanted to show um, just kind of how the progression of social awareness that kids are now, you know, having on with the culture and stuff like that and kind of how kids' voices are being more heard nowadays. Henceforth, the whole child advocate and then the little, little guy right there. So that led me to actually applying the designs onto uh, truck applications. So here are my three final layouts for the truck applications. Um, I have a lot of fun with this, but it was very, very hard in the beginning. Um, Mock-ups aren't my thing. So me trying to, you know, implement implement my design on, onto it. It was kind of frustrating, but in the long run, I did end up getting it. And so here, just the more blown up for you guys. Just type through these real quick. And here is that um, same, same three designs, and I actually applied them to garbage bins this time. The idea with this is kind of to have a whole body wrap as well, kind of 360. And then I also have some in photo mock-ups as well to kind of see how we would look, you know, in real life in a neighborhood. And I thought that they kind of stuck out. Each design kind of has a different point that kind of grabs your attention. And that's it for my senior thesis. Thank you guys. Thanks, Christian. Um, any questions for Christian about his project? I love all three of your designs. They really turned out super well. And I remember when you were sharing, oh, I think it was like last semester or the beginning of this semester, you were sharing your idea and I'm like, wow, that is so unique. I've never heard of like anything like that before. And you took something that is like so ordinary and not really attractive to look at to something really cool and eye-catching. So Thank you did you. an amazing job and each of your designs are a little bit different and so unique and I think you did an amazing job. Thank you so much, Kaylee. I was wondering if during your research, if you had found any other sort of infrastructural things that could use this sort of beautification. Um. Not in my research, uh, I kind of didn't explore that different avenue just because I was so focused on, you know, the garbage truck idea kind of wrapped my head around that. But um, I know if I was to further, you know, do a deeper research and deep dive in that I could um, easily find, you know, different things around our environment and community that, you know, could use this kind of beautification in a way. So I know there's different ways of implementing that around, around, around our surroundings and stuff like that. So, yeah. All right, thanks, Christian. All right, thanks, you guys. Okay. So our, our last presentation in this block of presentations is uh, Mason. All right. I have a lot to get through, so sorry, I might be flipping through some of these very quickly. All right, this is cash code. Hi, Mason. Uh, cash code is a project meant to address some user experience problems I've encountered with QR codes. It's not meant to replace QR codes, 
but provide an alternative. Uh, before I show any of it, uh, I'm going to show you some examples of poor use of QR codes. First one is here on Western's campus. Uh, here users can scan this QR code uh, to view Western's COVID dashboard, providing regularly updated testing information on campus. Now, as you can see by the screenshot here, it's kind of clunky and poorly optimized for mobile. And there's too much irrelevant information, I think, in my opinion, for most visitors, especially repeat visitors. Uh, and repeat visitors, of course, is the point of this for uh, regularly, regularly updated information. The second example here is a QR code uh, on one of my sketchbooks. Scanning it takes you to a store page uh, showing you where to purchase that sketchbook again. Now that's working as intended, uh, and some people might find that useful, but the code is unlabeled, and I felt kind of tricked when I scanned that and it took me to a store page. I felt sold to, and that was kind of disappointing. So how can this experience be improved? Uh, well, you can apply a bit of user experience principles to it. Uh, the first is predictability and consistency. In the con context of QR codes, this means that users are more likely to engage with the QR code if they know what kind of experience to expect and understand how to use it. They might ask, what will happen when I scan this QR code? Uh, will I know how to use it? Will it take me to a website? Will the website be optimized for mobile? Uh, and here under accessibilities, uh, users are more likely to engage with the QR code if it's made available to a wider audience. In this case, the user may ask if uh, I'm actually able to engage with this QR code experience. Uh, is it actually built for a wide range of demographics for those with disabilities? So the question becomes, in what ways can I apply basic UX principles to QR codes to create a new experience? We get cache code and fundamentally it's just a QR code plus a stories platform. Um, in cache code, users scan a custom QR code and it opens a story in the user's mobile browser on their phone. And these stories can be location bound and even made public where other users can contribute to an ongoing story. Talking about audience, cache code is built for anyone who uses QR codes today. And while that demographic is mostly 18 to 36 year olds, cash code is made simple enough for anyone to use, assuming they have a smartphone, of course. But talking about cash code as a project for myself, it uh, required me to build a brand, the web experience, which is basically moving stories onto uh, the web. Uh, it required me to make that custom cash code code sticker. Uh, and it also required a cash code app, which I will talk about more in a moment. There we go. All right, now I'll talk about the process a little bit here. Uh, this is the logo. Uh, very briefly here, it's it was made here to show uh, a QR code in the center, as well as those brackets around there. Those represent the reticule when you're actually scanning a QR code with your phone. And the whole thing kind of looks like a container as if something were inside, like a cache. Uh, you can see on the bottom right there, that is the final version of the logo. Uh, the sticker here can come in the form of a, well, a sticker or a magnet or can be printed on anything. Uh, and you can see the iterations here from the first version to the third. On the right here, you can see uh, different variations in color size or uh, on the top there is like a winter special edition. These stickers here are three inches tall for scale. So I knew pretty early on that the solution would be stories and I picked stories because of prior familiarity with most users know how to know what a story is most. Uh, stories are built for mobile um, and because QR codes are usually just used on mobile, that's perfect. And they're flexible and customizable using included tools in that platform. Like all of story platforms allow you to edit text and images and links and that sort of thing. But from here on out, I'm not gonna call them stories, I'm gonna call them caches, both because that's in my brand and because caches are different from stories in that caches don't expire after 24 hours. So whatever you attach to that QR code is gonna stay there. 
as long as you want it to stay there. Uh, what you see here is the earliest uh, digital sketches I got into uh, after pencil and paper. Uh, these were made in Figma, which is comparable to XD. Um, you can see here is where I implemented the scrolling card at the bottom showing additional cache information but that wasn't working too well. There were too many additional features I needed to add. And so I redesigned it. You can see a few iterations here on the right. Uh, I was placing a lot of emphasis here on the location with this big black bar, but that didn't last very long either. And you can see the V1 scroll card turned into V2. And this is the version that lasted pretty well. This was also the version that I first built in Webflow. Webflow is a visual coding platform comparable to Adobe Muse. Um, and this allowed me to actually mock up almost the entirety of the web experience and actually put it online so that when users use a cache code with their own phone, it pulls up in the browser as if it were real. Now that lasted a while, but I ran into some, I ran into some problems um, with some features still developing. Um, which eventually turned into version three on the right, which is the version you'll see in the demo. Uh, and what I meant by those feature revisions and such are cache categories and settings. And what I mean by that here is stuff like visibility. Is it a hidden cache? Is it unlisted? Uh, is it geofenced, meaning it'll notify people when they're near a cache code? Is it a public or a private? cache code. Um, even I was considering if post should time out like a traditional story platform, but that was scrapped. Um, you can see here that it was mostly like a branching tree where if you pick one feature, more features would become available to you and that wasn't working. Uh, that was the big problem with this whole setup. The solution was to just segregate each option and make each one exclusive from another so that turning one on doesn't affect any others. So you can here you can see on the first version on the left here, you can turn on a public cache completely independent from say a hidden cache or showing the location. Uh, that was the first iteration of that publishing screen and that turned into the second version here. Um, after I talked to an expert and he uh, he talked about a term called progressive disclosure, uh, which means not overwhelming a user with too many options. Uh, just show some options when other options become enabled. For example, here, when you enable show location, it provides you with more features here, including enable the geofence, notifying users when they are near the cache code. Uh, the cache code app, which I'll show in a moment, this is a screenshot of that process. There's not too much to touch on with that right now, uh, what you see is pretty much it right there. Uh, now I will show a live demo of how cache code works. One moment, please. All right, what I have here is my phone on the right. Um, I don't believe I optimized this for mobile. I'm sorry, hold on, uh, optimize for video. Okay, that should be a lot better right there. Okay, so this first example I have is of that COVID dashboard from earlier. And you can see here, the QR code has been replaced by a cache code. And opening that cache code shows a brief condensed and uh, much easier to consume version of what you saw previously. Um, like most story platforms, you can tap anywhere to see more. In this case, I have links to learn more and visit the full COVID dashboard if people are interested. If you scroll up, um, you get information like where this loc where this cache code is located. You get the title, the number of lights and scans, the date, even a like button that actually works. This button that says, what's this, is for new users who have never experienced a cache code. You tap that and it prompts you to download the app. Let's try another. This one is that sketchbook from earlier, scanning it instead of taking you to a store page, 
I thought it'd be interesting to feature other artists' work right there. And those would, if this were real, that would probably link to the artist's Instagram, say. Uh, very similar here with the number of likes and scans. Another here, this one can be found along a hiking trail at Crater Lake. Scanning it shows a story of people who have visited. And one more briefly. This one is found in a subway. Someone wrote on here, check out my playlist. And sure enough, they are showing a play playlist here that you can listen to during your commute. And this is, along with the previous one at Crater Lake, this is a public cache where other users can upload it to this cache. In this case, they can contribute their own playlists. And that's what this button in the bottom right is for. Tapping it, again, prompts you to download the app. All right. Okay, so I mentioned the app and the app here is for scanning cache codes, for creating cache code content and for locating cache codes on the map and for receiving notifications when you're nearby a cache code with that geofence feature. Uh, this app isn't a super high fidelity prototype or mocked up in any way. Uh, this is just to get the idea across. Uh, same as if you didn't have the app installed, you can scan any cache code and it'll open in the app. Uh, if you happen to have the app installed and you use your phone's default camera, it'll open in the app as well. Uh, using the map, you can view nearby cache codes and public caches that I mentioned uh, a moment ago here are also shown on the map. Uh, hidden caches are not shown on the map. Those are the ones that you have to find with your own eyes in real life. They're hidden like a geocache or something. Uh, from here, you can view your user profile and all of your active caches, uh, the number of scans, etc. Right here under the cache archive are all of your inactive or removed caches uh, that you might want to just keep for safekeeping. Uh, on the right here, after tapping on one of your caches, you get cache details. And from your cache details, you can view your cache notifications. You can view all your cache uploads in order with that horizontal list right there. And you can edit individual uploads with this button. And here you can view and edit all of your overhead cache settings, like your title and location. Uh, you can create a cache code. Sorry, uh, I missed something there. Um, but you can create a cache code um, here by scanning any empty cache code. Uh, these cache codes are sold in packs of varying numbers, uh, you know, online or in the store. Scan an empty cache code and you can upload content to it like uh, any other story platform that you're familiar with. And hitting the next button takes you to the publish screen that we've seen before, where you can edit the location, the public or hidden cache, or even show old upload the oldest uploads first, essentially reversing the order that viewers see the uploads. Okay, so this is, so the web and the app are two different experiences. The web version is built for users who don't have the app and may not need the app. They're just viewing the content. The app is for making the content and viewing the map. I suspect that like 90% of users may never touch the app, may never need to touch the app uh, because the point of cache code is, is the content and making a more optimized QR code experience. Um, honestly, that could, be like the end game for cash code being such um, that it's more about the content um, and it's more seam seamless experience um, and kind of reimagining QR codes. Um, I think there's a great potential for cash code to be expanded with additional features, uh, you know, taking over more and more um, the functionality of QR codes today. Um, Yes, yeah, so that is cache code. I'm going to leave up these mockups here for everyone to scan with your own phones here during questions. They all work uh, as if cache code were real. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mason. Great job. Um, 
questions for Mason. How come you decided to scrap uh, stories expiring rather than leaving them constant? I did that um, because I see businesses taking advantage of cash code and they may not want that functionality. In the case of that sketchbook example that I showed, you probably wouldn't want that expiring. You would want um, those examples of artists work up there as a marketing tool, you know, to not disappear probably. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'd imagine that feature could be added in later versions of the cache code. I really like how you incorporated kind of like a personal touch and like with the part where you have to share your adventure and like check out my playlist. I think that's like pretty cool because it brings it not only to be like digital, but like in person kind of thing. So good job with that. I really like the project. Thanks. I think it's really special um, for QR codes in general that you can, you can bridge the physical and the digital space um, and especially having this personal touch in it. I think uh, cash code is very unique in that way. So thanks. This whole semester, I've never seen your project. And I just want to say, like, I was playing, I just was scanning the codes. And um, this is honestly just so amazing. Um, you did a really good job on everything. Thanks. I was hoping if someone scanned these with no context, they'd be tricked into thinking it were real. <laughs> I feel like it's definitely pretty real. It looks real. Like it looks like I should be able to download it from the app store. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Yep. Thanks, Mason. So we, uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending this first uh, group of presentations. Um, we're going to take a break and um, start up again at 11 o'clock. So you can stretch your legs and get something to eat, get something to nibble on. Um, so thanks again for attending and uh, hopefully we'll see most of you back at 11 o'clock. So, um, if you're just joining us again, um, this is the uh, 2021 senior thesis presentations, and we're glad you could join us for that. For this, uh, the seniors have put in a lot of hard work, and they're excited to share their projects with you. And if you have any questions, you can hold those to the end of uh, the presentation, and there will be a few minutes for questions after each presentation. And I encourage you to uh, ask ask them questions. They they're pretty knowledgeable about their topics. So. Um, 
And again, for the presenters, I will be giving you uh, little time warnings with these signs. So if you uh, keep my video thumbnail in your view and watch for that, then you'll know when you have two minutes remaining for your presentation. Um, so uh, without further ado, then we'll uh, move on with our schedule, starting with Prince. Hey. Um, you're breaking up just a little bit. I'm, it might be because my video is on. I, I was assuming, I was hoping it would work, but is it okay if I have my video off while I give the presentation? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if that's what you need to do to keep your connection from freezing up. Okay. We good? Okay, cool. All right, good morning. Um, I'm Prince Dillard, and this is my senior graphic design thesis project, Anti. Um, anime is not a genre. It's an art style with certain motifs and stereotypes, but it's a means to tell a story more than anything else. It can tell stories, and it can represent characters of any and all types, just the same as how skating is not just an extreme sport, but a community with passionate members of all diversities all around the world. So how can I use design to create a brand that takes inspiration from anime, manga, and skateboarding to craft an identity and products that will appeal to fans of all three subcultures while building the community of a new one? My demographic would be fans of anime, manga, comics, and cartoons from ages about 10 to 24. I got this demographic uh, from the influences and inspirations that I took and who I thought would be interested in that as well as who I thought would be most susceptible to the takeaways of the brand, which are community, diversity, self-expression, and passion. It's about expressing yourself as an individual and not being afraid of your own unique identity, not just expressing your interests, but sharing that love with like-minded people around you. And there's nothing wrong with being passionate about something. And one interest or hobby does not dictate the way a person should be perceived. You aren't uh, weird because you watch anime or you know a hoodlum because you like to skate. Some of my uh, inspirations were on online artists like Van Gogh from Instagram, as well as uh, skate companies like Primitive Skateboarding. We've done collaborations with Naruto and Dragon Ball Z, and Chocolate Skate <coughs> Chocolate Skateboarding. Excuse me. Uh, my design and Aesthetic were influenced a lot by vintage anime shows and movies like Akira, One Piece, Cowboy Bebop, and Sailor Moon. Some of my early brand names included Tokyo Dreams, The Heat Seekers, No Signal, Obsidian, Anti Label, and many more, as you can see uh, over on the right, my sketches of all the possible names. And on the left, I just put a few of the, the standouts as I was sketching. As I sketched more, I realized that I wanted to kind of carry that counterculture idea through more in the design of the brand as well, uh, like the logo taking kind of a minimalist approach for the logo type and the motifs used throughout the branding, like the use of the triangle that I would end up using. And you can kind of see how over time I started to gravitate more towards the anti idea and see how I can integrate the triangle. Um, and in the bottom right is kind of what Will become the finished product a lot of sketches later i landed on this with a minimalist logo type that i made and the japanese writing or kanji that also reads anti sprawled across resembling graffiti again representing that counterculture idea but also kind of reminiscent of blood representing the passion of the community uh, the font i suppose i'd call anti font i made to reflect the simplicity of the brand I knew I wanted the basis of the brand and the logo type to be simple and sort of muted using a lot of black and gray so that they would contrast with the, the bright colors and the exaggerated features of the graphic elements more. Um, early on, the idea came up of using anti as a header to a number of subhead words that could carry out the attitude of the brand further. So anti hate, anti stress, anti conformity. These all have, these all kind of have a specific meaning that are meant to say, you know, we're against it and anti-label being the big uh, umbrella under which they all fall 
as the last label always. It was kind of like a cyberpunk like ad that's very cool and I think fit the aesthetic very well. Um, sorry, I'm kind of jerky there. Um, as well as a, a mock up at a bus stop. It gets the brand across very quickly and it lets you know the key idea is straight to the point. So that's kind of the, the branding element that I was leaning for. Um, I've spoken about how the branding is muted and simple, but I also created all these variations with different color schemes and more playful elements to show the brand it still works even with all these changes. And it's flexible, not just to more zany design ideas, but also to collaborations, different patterns and uh, color combinations that are a little, a little bit more outlandish. And not every one of these wouldn't even necessarily need to be used, but just their creation is kind of an expression of how the the brand can be stretched, if you will. Um, different prints, animal prints, tie dye, and different graphic elements kind of added. Uh, here are some of the reference photos I use for the character design. And uh, here you'll see some of the characters interacting with some of the early brand names as I was cooking up uh, the ideas and trying to figure out what we would come to. Eventually, um, I gravitated once again towards the anti idea with the subheads. I kind of thought that there could be a unique connection. So after I established the subheads, I thought that I could reflect the brand attitude further by tying the characters specifically to them. Um, so I thought that I knew that I wanted to create characters for the brand from the beginning. I knew it was the perfect representation of the art style, but it was only when I kind of established the anti idea and the subheads that I started, I started to be able to think how I could carve out each one's individual identity a little bit more. And uh, here you'll see some sketches of ones that came along. Some of these would be very verbatim for what the final digital sketch would look like, and some would be very different. Um, and here are the, the final sketches. As I developed each character deeper, I gave them names and little quotes to represent their uh, identity and their subhead. Like Vic, who says, stop trying to be like everybody else, fitting for the, the one who's connected to anti-conformity. But yeah, they all have little unique profiles that I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, together we are anti-label. So these characters could serve almost as mascots for uh, the brand on ads. And on clothes. Skateboard decks. Both orientations. And uh, with the development of the brand comes the application of skate gear like trucks. Wheels. Helmets and pads, grip tape, and skate decks themselves, of which I designed somewhere about 30, 30 plus, I believe. Um, and I tried to get a good mix of the minimalist branding style as well as that colorful graphic style um, using the triangles and the, uh, the kanji as a motif very strongly throughout trying to have a mix of both orientations, sometimes paying homage to earlier ideas like the Dark Side of the Moon cover, as well as the VHS tape, the subhead board, uh, boards to represent the seasons or a city feel or just the, the color palette that you might see in an anime. Some board, <clears throat> excuse me, some decks are meant to work together. Um, uh, like a collection, like these ones, uh, I call the generic collection depicting typical everyday products, but antified, if you will, uh, as well as these two meant to emulate a VHS tape and its packaging, not just because it's graphically interesting, but because the rise in popularity of both of these cultures, anime and skating can be attributed to tape trading and the, and like pure word of mouth in the, the late eighties and the early nineties as well as the application of a lot of clothing, um, at times carrying over designs from the decks um, and others trying to follow through with that minimalist style, some bit more uh, graphic style. 
um, use of the pattern um, and those soft colors. As well as the triangle, um, with tees, crews, hoodies, jackets, even overalls and some kind of crazier uh, applications like a bulletproof vest, just kind of to show the the wide range of unique applications that the, these could be applied to. Um, as well as sweats, shorts, undergarments, and of course dad hats. I like these particularly. Um, I love the way that the applications uh, turned out, but to me, the, I think that it screams out more potential. And this is kind of like a season one of a clothing drop. So I feel like in the future, I could definitely come back and see what else could come from this. Um, Cause I feel like there's a lot more potential to it. Uh, of course, this is anti-label, but we do need tags. So on every piece of, piece of clothing would be a tag um, printed on the inside with the tagline stop labeling and the website if the clothes were being sold in like a retail setting like a skate shop or the mall and a physical hanging tag is necessary then uh, what the one at the bottom is what you'd see of course if you ordered off the website uh, your package would come delivered in a box like one of these again kind of focusing on the minimalist style with that anti-brand standing out the one on the left being for a deck the one uh, in the middle being for, you know, any number of items, a shirt, a hoodie, and the one on the right being kind of taller for like a hat or something like that. Uh, I also thought it would be interesting to integrate vending machines into my brand since they're such a big motif in anime and they're ubiquitous throughout Japan. Um, I thought it would be cool conceptually to set up like anti-branded vending machines at random spots close to skate parks have them serve as a unique form of advertising as well as moving the product. Um, and inside the vending machine would be unique packaging going back to those generic product ideas you saw in a few deck designs earlier, but anti-branded. So the, so these were my early digital sketches for those. Um, and uh, as I got a little bit further, they developed a bit more. So this is like a stout soup can where you would find a rolled up pair of shorts inside and a milk carton where you'd find a rolled up shirt inside find a full pack of cigarettes or a pair of socks inside. Say no to smoking. And uh, inside the drink can would be a set of wheels. I thought this would be a fun way of moving the product and uh, sort of interacting with the community that much more, you know, say on social media, go get something unique from the the anti-vending machine and post next to the machine when you do. Um, here are a few mock-up sticker designs. Stickers are another huge line of untapped potential, I feel. Uh, those are big and really, those are really big in both cultures of skating and anime, you know, of skating, sticker bombing things and stuff like that. And uh, anime, just kind of the the reference of it all. Um, so that's, a, that's something that could be explored a lot deeper in the future. Uh, as well as the social media, um, I established an Instagram account, posted on it uh, somewhat frequently recently, um, but uh, it's very much in its infancy. So, and lastly, uh, a website uh, carrying through with that minimalist idea it would just be one continuous scroll showing off the range of the products uh, with the option to see all of those products if you clicked in like the bottom right. Um, but just one long scroll with a simple banner at the top, throwing off products. And if you say right here, if you click see all decks, then you'd be taken to a similar page, but it would uh, list off all the prices and the names and you could see all, all 30 plus boards that were designed um, and have your pick of it. And at the bottom of the, of the page would be the anti-label crew and you could uh, pick any one of them and see their unique character profile where it has their name, their age, and just a few of the a few interesting things that kind of carve them out a little bit more as an individual, even though they're not real. Uh, you know, the real us. <laughs> um, so their likes and their dislikes, and this would be unique for every character. So that's another way to kind of be unique as a brand and show that community side. Um, and a product page would look like this. Um, and that's all I have, uh, but 
thank you for listening. Um, I think my biggest takeaway is that the devil is in the details because early on, I was very much intimidated by the number of things that I wanted to do so much so that I think it. It hindered me early and I was kind of scared to just go in and get a lot of work done. And so much so that I think it cost me some time that I could have used to go through with a fine tooth comb and make things better. So, but regardless, um, I had fun making this even when it was stressful. So I think it was successful. Thank you. We have time for some questions for Prince. Hi, uh, Prince. I enjoyed seeing all your graphics. I was wondering whether you wrote all the Japanese characters for your identity or their existing font. Yeah, it's only um, the only ones I use were the were the ones in like the main the main logo. That's only Japanese kanji I used at any point, um, but it means anti, and I'm I'm pretty sure it's correct. I hope it's correct. I got it from like an online translator, but I went to several and like more official ones, not just like Google Translate to try to make sure. So I hope it's right. <laughs> Did you write those or they're in a certain font? No, I didn't write them. Um, okay. I used uh, paint brushes on uh, oh. Illustrator, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Were you thinking for your package designs that the black boxes would be all from the website and then the like uh, sort of mock product ones would be just for the vending machine or yeah, so either I, way? Yeah, that was what I was thinking. That would kind of be a little bit of incentive a little bit more incentive for people to go to that vending machine because, you know, it, it's kind of a cool word of mouth idea, I'd suppose, um, as well as that social media aspect. So, yeah, kind of this more basic packaging if you were to order online um, and then the, the mock product packaging in the vending machine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a really cool idea. Thank you. Prince, uh, Prince, I think you have a really extensive product line. Um, what's your plan? Do you have a plan for the future to actually maybe implement some of this, or at least on a certain scale? Or what? Um, it just seems like it's so extensive that you should push it somewhere. Uh, yeah. What are your ideas? Yeah, I would love to do that. Um, I got hit with a few setbacks in the recent weeks that kind of that kind of hindered my progress a little bit. I was planning on trying to make a real uh, mock-up of a deck with like a real physical one, which I think would be kind of the perfect, uh, I'm not sure which, but I think would be kind of the perfect showpiece to go along with this. But um, yeah, that's what I was talking about in, in terms of the clothing as well, how um, I have a lot of applications, but not a lot of like mock-ups or kind of ideas on what it would look like physically. So I think that's a thing that can be explored and kind of be, be make it more interesting in the future, I suppose. And there are so many places that will, um, uh, you can upload your graphics to that you don't have to pay for the product and you can still have it in a store, you know, like Teespring and um, uh, some of these other, Cafe Press. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are probably similar things for skateboard companies. So like, you wouldn't have to risk doing a huge production. You, you definitely should uh, uh, put this out into the world. Got a lot of good stuff. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Prince. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. We have Kelton next up. All right. So I'm Kelton, and for a little bit of background on this project, I decided to brand a music producer. So a couple of years ago, I happened across the girl next door while searching for small artists on SoundCloud. 
And after skimming through their catalog of tracks, I was incredibly surprised by the disparity between the quality and the quantity of content that they were producing and their number of followers. So after asking if I could use some of their music for free, they said, of course I could, as long as I gave them credit, because that's really all they were looking for, just a little exposure, and they definitely deserved it. Unfortunately, the lo-fi genre doesn't often allow for a creator like this to get the following that they want. The majority of lo-fi content exists behind this fog of mixes and collections distributed by third parties. And these third party sources for music are the primary holders of consistent brand identities and rarely do they share the love by highlighting a specific artist. Every song in a mix is presented on the same level playing field. So the problem is when there are so many items on the menu, it's almost impossible for one artist to stand out <clears throat> within a collection. So lo-fi fans are usually just that, fans of lo-fi as a genre. Of course, anyone can be a fan of any genre, but when it comes to something like pop, for instance, it's artists that attract fans, not necessarily the broader genre. And fans can follow an artist and get excited about new tracks from that specific artist. And this is the creator audience relationship that I wanted the girl next door to have. I couldn't just let such a talented producer get overlooked like so many others. There had to be a way for them to step through the fog and present themselves as a creator worth following. Because in truth, The Girl Next Door is way more than background music to relax and study to. Their content is deep, emotional, and honest, and they deserve a spotlight. So that's why I'm doing all this, because The Girl Next Door is an incredibly skilled lo-fi and trap producer. And as they continue to release tracks, there becomes a greater need for consistency and professionalism regarding style and branding. So a thorough branding overhaul would attract a larger audience and communicate their unique style of music to more potential listeners and clients. And because of the content that they share, which is strewn about with references to internet culture, memes and counterculture, they attract a much younger audience. Uh, roughly 17 to 25, and because of the subject matter of their tracks, they bring in an audience that's dealing with more serious real-life problems for the first time. Things like love, loss, depression, rejection, heartbreak, and the like. And this can be found in the titles and imagery and audio samples used throughout their tracks. So to really capture the tone and messages of their work, I started by collecting imagery that related to their music. I was looking for anything that reflected the recognizable aspects of their work and lo-fi as a broader genre. Luckily, imagery is the one thing besides music that they did have in droves already. Every track is released with either a static image or a simple gif that relates to the tone of the song. Many times this meant images that portrayed the abstract idea of this alternative dyed hair girl next door character. Of course, I needed all this imagery in one place as a consistent source of inspiration for the message I, I wanted to convey. Although admittedly cluttered in many ways, this research map holds all of the themes that I wanted to focus on while building the TGND brand. So with all this inspiration and direction in front of me, I wanted to dive right into creating album covers. After all, it's one of my favorite things to design. Uh, originally, I wanted to focus on the digital and low fidelity aspect of their music, lo-fi meaning low fidelity. So I played around a lot with this theme of pixelated hands and I was really having a good idea with the idea of warping and melting images too. I thought this made sense as the girl next door was warping samples that they used throughout their work. And this was a really fun technique. I thought it might be interesting to have their chosen imagery also illustrated in a unique style. While some of their some of these looked pretty interesting and even represented the brand pretty well, it wasn't until I had a talk with our own design professor, Paul Sizer, that I was able to really hammer down on the needs of this specific artist. I had to be asking myself um, what they, where they are in their career and what that means as far as how they can realistically utilize this identity. And the truth was that they had an existing system for releasing tracks. And at the rate that they produce, they actually would need something of a template to where they could plug in their own images, but still stand apart from tracks within the same genre. So for this, I needed to consider where they have the most solid presence, that being SoundCloud, but also more recently extending into YouTube. So I attempted to make this template, which would be more user friendly for the artist. And some of these designs that I made were pretty usable, but they didn't really carry the visual impact that I wanted. It wasn't until I started thinking of ways to frame images for each track that I would start focusing on 
retro media hardware as a common theme. I tried a bunch of different ways of using floppy disks to frame images. This gave the tracks a more tangible look, and it really made sense because The Girl Next Door was creating within a genre that utilizes audio artifacts left over from physical sources. So for instance, the sound of a tape deck changing or the crackle of a record spinning. And um, <clears throat> with this approach, I was doing something very similar. I was taking an entirely digital and modern way of releasing music and bringing back in that physical nostalgia. So I went down this rabbit hole for a while, and even though it was looking pretty interesting and unique, it was pointed out to me that perhaps my audience didn't have such nostalgia for that particular media source. And that was really true. My audience grew up consuming media through the flicker of CRT screens and the grain of VHS tapes. So this template that I created has everything that the artist needs to quickly input their own images and upload to SoundCloud or Instagram. So finally, each track can not only stand alongside its own image, but when seen on the website or the app, the whole collection can be solid and cohesive. So from here, it was a short leap to develop a similar template for YouTube. All I needed to do was consider the change in aspect ratio to design a VHS frame for their YouTube releases. These frames allow for opportunities to release tracks with the looping GIFs that the girl next door was so fond of. The final brand mark came about by a way of a lot of experimentation with combining symbols that could describe this girl next door character, the genre and the subject matter of their content. However, before I even considered designing an image based mark, I was focused on type. The girl next door almost begs to be abbreviated. So that was my original direction. And since all of their content is in a digital format and digitally distributed, I wanted the word mark to look modern as as modern as possible, because lo-fi in and of itself is a very contemporary genre. So for this, a geometric sans serif choice of typeface made perfect sense. I eventually landed on a typeface called All Round Gothic, which allowed me to sort of warp it in a lot of ways and still have very geometric forms. Uh, and to play homage to the fact that many of their songs match together samples, I wanted the letter forms to be connected in a natural way. Uh, and also, playing off of the intentionally careless capitalization of all of the titles of their tracks, I went with all lowercase. So, once I had my uh, track release format set, I still wanted to portray this ever-changing dream girl character with some sort of brand mark. Something that could work in tandem with the word mark that I had already developed. So, considering the girl next door's constant references to anime and counterculture, I wanted this mark to contain some sort of visually striking hairstyle. So after a lot of trial and error, I eventually landed on a profile view of a ponytail and bangs. And with only a few tweaks, the mark culminated in not just hair and headphones, but it takes the shape of a heart as well. So having a consistent identity to communicate the value of the Girl Next Door's music was great and all, but I also wanted to design something for the fans. And during my conversation with Paul, we spoke about considering where this artist may go in the future and what that means they may need. Many artists collect extra income from merchandising, so I developed a few common merchandise items that fans of The Girl Next Door could potentially purchase in the future. Things like shirts, hats, socks, and everyone's new favorite face masks. I also had another conversation with Brett Balcom, a singer and songwriter out of Muskegon, Michigan. And we spoke in depth about the importance of simple and strategically placed advertising. In his case, he uses posters to try to get an audience to attend a live show. But in my case, the consumption of the Girl Next Door's music would be entirely online. So for this purpose, I developed a series of stickers that contain QR codes that will potentially take listeners, uh, take potential listeners directly to the Girl Next Door's SoundCloud page. And merch was a good way to prepare for the producer's future needs, but in an effort to stay grounded to what the Girl Next Door could realistically distribute at this time, I decided to develop a few desktop wallpapers and posters that relate to the brand and the content they produce. A couple of these focus on their top songs and a couple focus on them as a broader brand. I also wanted to make this creator as shareable as possible. So to do this, I developed a fully functional Snapchat filter. This filter utilizes the same VHS aesthetic and lighting treatment as my track release format. As soon as the user opens up the filter, they're greeted by the girl next door's top track, appropriately titled On Top. 
My hope is to get users as immersed into the music as possible, and what better way to do that than to allow them to put themselves directly into this girl next door's world that I've created. I also needed to consider how the audience would want to consume this music. As it stands, the Girl Next Door's SoundCloud page is not organized. Even fans of this particular artist will probably want to consume their music in much the same that way that they're used to, the same way that third-party lo-fi aggregators have caused fans of the genre to get used to, and that being simple looping animations with a curated collection of tracks. Only this time, the tracks would be from this one producer. So I'm going to share a quick snippet of this animation. I'm just gonna unshare and reshare real quick here. One second. All right. So I'll share just a quick snippet of that animation right now. So this collection has an hour's worth of tracks that work as both ambient background music and a consistent morose tone themed around heartbreak. The images that flicker on the CRT screen reflect the common theme found throughout the Girl Next Door's work. Most lo-fi fans will be familiar with the lo-fi girl studying and intermittently looking out of her window as tracks play on shuffle. I hope to create a similar vignette into a real space by mixing photography with an audio responsive animation. And creating this animation was quite a step outside of my comfort zone, considering that I had worked minimally with Adobe After Effects in the past. And creating a mixed media animation such as this required a lot of research and tutorials to make it turn out how I wanted. Especially considering that I needed the video to be an hour long to be optimized for YouTube searches. I had to do a lot of testing with possible routes that I could take, such as this audio responsive hard drive animation. Uh, for some reason, it's not being pulled up. There we go. So I ended up not going in that direction, but it did turn out to be an opportunity to create a pretty cool profile picture that integrates nicely with my um, with my current format and with my heart logo. So working with this brand was really interesting. Working on uh, such a small artist meant considering a lot of things that would not apply to a larger company. Uh, Nick Adam, when he was presenting to us earlier this year, said that you find success as a designer by making others successful. And that was really in the back of my mind during this whole process. So after all the work that I put in and all of the experimenting that I went through, I believe that this identity does an excellent job representing this particular producer. And I think that it will thoroughly serve its purpose in bringing in a dedicated audience for the girl next door. Thank you everyone for watching my presentation. Questions for Elton? Would so you have you reached out? Oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> have you reached out to the girl next door to show them the final product yet? Uh, not yet. I wanted to get everything completely fleshed out and then um, hopefully, I'm thinking later this week, I'll probably just reach out to them and be like, hey, I've got some some stuff I've made that you might want. Just bring them into a video chat and have sort of a big surprise. So hopefully they like it. Will you be taking on a, a new artist and trying to brand with someone else at any any time in the future? Oh man, that, that would be really cool. Um, I think, you know, part of my process with coming up with actually wanting to do 
branding for producer, I was sort of running through my mind of things that I'm a fan of that don't have much branding. So I, I thought of things like podcasts that have a large listenership, but don't have much branding, um, other small artists. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd like to do that. If I'm going to expand on it, I would probably do another collection of their music first with maybe a different theme and a new animation and make that maybe like a monthly thing. Sounds like a plan. It's <laughs> great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kelton. Great job. Okay, we have Jalen next. All right. Uh, let me pull my screen up real quick. Okay. Oh, I need that little toolbar to go away. All right. All right. So hello, everyone, um, and happy Earth Day. <laughs> Um, so I have designed an educational app for kids and young adults called Pickup. It's a smartphone app that encourages recycling and trash cleanup by turning it into a game. So how it works is by a two factor authentication system. So you take a picture of the litter where you find it and then another picture once you've properly disposed of it. By using image recognition software, the app can recognize different materials and put it into categories. Different trash and recycled materials are with different amounts of points. The litter that causes the most harm to animals in the environment is worth the most, and the less threatening material, material are worth the least. Um, by properly disposing of trash, you can use your points to unlock prizes and facts that educate the user on how they have helped the environment. You can also donate your points toward green ideas and petitions in your community. My initial inspiration came from noticing how much litter was in the parking lot of my apartment complex. There are always plastic bags floating around, styrofoam cups right by the dumpster that don't make it in, and a lot of miscellaneous small pieces of litter that get blown right into the woods nearby. And it made me think, why do we just walk by trash when there's a trash can or dumpster a few feet away? And because for a lot of people, there is no incentive or instant gratification to cleaning up litter. No one thinks that the single water bottle or chip bag is going to make a difference to the planet, but it does. Animals are harmed by litter, and so is the Earth. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but there seems to be a lot more trash around Kalamazoo lately. Any open field is littered almost all the parking lots. Whenever you look down late, whenever you look down, you will probably see some sort of litter pollution. Trash builds up faster than we can take care of it, and it's time we do something about that. We built habits at a young age, and it's important to be educated on the effects litter has on the planet. Pickup is aimed at kids age 10 and up to instill a conscious effort about making sure we are taking care of our planet. Litter is dangerous to animals in our environment, Properly disposing of trash helps you, me, our planet, your community, and more animals than we can even count. However, cleaning up litter isn't that fun all on its own. I wanted to show kids how they can make a difference by making it a game. A game that gives acknowledgement and gratification for doing something good for the planet. And even though the game is aimed at kids, it can be fun for all ages. If every student at Western picked up one piece of trash and properly disposed of it, that would be over 24,000 pieces of trash. Now imagine if every household or every elementary school did the same or if everyone picked up two pieces or even three. We would make a huge difference to the litter problem we are currently facing. I started with intense research on how much harm litter does to the environment and the animals that inhabit it to build a list of facts for the app. I learned a lot of information myself during the research stage. Litter pollutants affect us in ways we don't even realize. Plastic absorbs persistent bioaccumulative toxins or PBTs, which get ingested by animals and if you eat meat, then eventually you ingest PBTs too. Facts like these made me want to continue my research to build my fact list because we are unaware of how much harm litter pollution really causes. Also, during my sketching process, I went into the structure of the app and how it would function as a whole. Along with that, an extensive sketching process for logo design, typeface design, and illustration. Here are just a few of my sketches for the final ideas of logo design I started. Um, I started with the idea of arrows, animals, or even a camera, but I finally decided on a design I felt that would fit best. So the final logo design is a fox on an orange background. The structure of its face and arms represent arrows pointing down, while the line on its tail has the arrows going up to abstractly represent the act of picking up. I wanted to use an animal because little kids love them, but also so many different species are harmed by litter pollution. We cause that harm. And if we make a conscious effort to clean our mess, we will be helping so many animals. 
When I was thinking of a color palette, I started with a lot of greens and blues, but I felt like whenever we see environmental graphics, it's a very commonplace palette. I've always loved warm colors because they felt happy and fun. So my final design uses a soft palette of orange, yellow, slate gray, green, blue, and then white. The color palette is energetic and playful to keep the user engaged. I then went on to develop a wireframe to map out how a user would get from screen to screen. This helped me create an app that was easy to navigate, but still educational and fun. Mapping out every screen helped me see if there were any clunky parts or snags in the navigation. Eventually, I connected all the screens and ran through tests to make sure I was optimizing for user experience. Once I added color, the whole app finally felt like it was coming together. The personality of Pickup was finally coming through how I envisioned. I started illustrating fun shapes, the animal characters that users unlock, and I even designed my own map that fit with the color palette. And here are just a few animals that I illustrated. All of their colors are customizable on the app, so I added a few examples of different customizations. The animals you see are some of the ones most harmed by litter. I created my own illustration style for the animals. I wanted them to have a cute, collectible feel, but also for them to have individuality. So without further ado, I'm excited to show you guys pick up. Um, I just want to make sure the video is working right. So if it's not playing or anything, Ryan, will you just give me like a thumbs up or thumbs down and just let me know and I can switch to a different screen share. All right, so this is pick up. Um, we start on the loading screen and then we go to the sign in page where you can create an account, sign in, or if you forgot your password, you can do this here too. Um, so let's go to create an account. All you have to do is enter your email, phone number, create a username, password, and then double check it to make sure it's right and submit. And if you forgot your password, we can do that here too. So just enter an email, a verification code will be sent to your phone, and then you just double check a password and then submit. So let's sign in. Again, username, password. Um, here is the home page. I wanted to keep the colors fun and bright. You can access the group wall, the leaderboards, and the map from here. So let's check out the map. Um, so here you are, this little blue dot, and then all around you, these orange pins are highly littered areas in your community. So if you want to start a new adventure, the app picks a direction for you. Um, it'll tell you about how long the walk is along with the distance. But if you want to choose your own route, you can explore and choose your own pin out of all these pins on the map. So let's do this one and start an adventure. And then same as before, it'll tell you the walk along with the distance. And when you start a new adventure, the don't screen pops up. And this is just some things to keep in mind while using the app, such as don't trespass, don't trespass on private property, don't pick up hazardous material, and areas outlined in red on the map are danger zones, such as busy roads, lakes, rivers, so just be careful around those. And then just click OK. And then for supplies, um, it just tells you some things that you'll need while using the app, such as your phone, um, some good walking shoes, a reusable bag for trash recycling or treasure, and then guardian's approval, gloves to keep your hands safe and clean, and then you are ready to go. So just take a picture of the trash where you find it in the environment, and then you just go down to capture. And then once again, where you when you throw it away, and then you unlock prizes. Um, so we have enough points for the cat right now. It'll give a little description, or you can donate the points. So here are green ideas by people started in your community, um, such as a year of recycling for a family or a new bench in the park. So let's check out the bench. Um, and then it'll just give a little description that the person wrote about it. Um, and it'll give you different donation options that you can do. Um, they've also attached a picture, so you can either donate um, the 25, 50, or 100 points. So let's do the 200 points, then just click donate, and then you confirm. And then a little thank you will pop up because you just did a great thing. And then this page takes you to your history where you can see all the other donations that you've helped. Um, but if you want to go to prizes, um, you can see the points and why it's worth it, such as plastic being worth 15 points, styrofoam 10, so on. Um, and if you click on it, it'll give a little bit more of a description as to why something's worth the most points. So plastic is worth the most because it does the most harm to the environment overall. And this just uh, uh, evaluates a little further on what I've been saying. Um, and so then if you want to go back to prizes, you can also see the animals that you've unlocked. So far, we've unlocked the cat, the fox, and the bear. And when you haven't unlocked an animal yet, it'll be kind of shadowed, but it will give a little hint about what um, the animal will be, along with how many points you need until you unlock it. Um, these are also all customizable. So if you click on the cat, you can customize the name, the hair color, an accessory if you find it, or even the eye color. And then if we go back home, um, you can check out the groups, leaderboards, challenge, or add friends here. 
So if you wanted to go to the group wall, you can see what your friends have been up to lately. Um, you can help them on some of the latest pickup projects, um, or you can make a post yourself. And then if you go to the leaderboard, you can see how you're stacking up next to your friends, who's picked up the most pieces of trash this week. And then you can challenge friends to the weekly challenge, which I'll get to in a minute. And you can also add friends from contacts or by username. So if you go to your profile, you can see your picture there, you can edit it, um, you see your name, and you can add your favorite animal as a sticker on your profile, um, along with how many points you have currently. And then the weekly challenge, um, so this week's wonky water. So whoever picks up 50 wonky water hazards wins the challenge and you unlock a special prize only accessible from the challenge. Um, and then down below, you see past challenges that have passed. And then if you go back, um, you can see unlocked, you can unlock prizes from here, such as animations, reusable bags, um, stickers, and more fun stuff like that. And so then if you go to your stats, you can see how many pieces of trash you picked up today, how many more pieces of trash you picked up from your friend, and how much you picked up this week. And so along with that, um, if we go to the facts page, yeah, facts page, um, you can see the facts that you've unlocked from your past pickups. So they just go in reverse chronological order. Um, and if you want to learn more about that fact, you can have a, one of your little stickers tell you about it. Um, and to go in depth, you just click the history and it'll tell you where you unlock that fact, along with how many pieces of trash you did, you picked up to unlock that fact. Um, and then just the fact repeated underneath. And then if we go back to home, um, and then last but not least, we have our uh, new green ideas. So you can create a new green idea. Um, here are some of your friends and you just click new green idea. And all you do is you write a description, add a photo, how many points it's worth, and you submit. And then people can donate toward your green idea. Um, so that is pickup. Let me. So that is pickup. Um, I wanted to make it fun, educational, and just kind of um, engaging. So the user wanted to keep, you know, experiencing the app and learning more about how they could help their environment. Because I think a lot of the times we don't think that small actions can make a difference, and they really do. And that's definitely something to instill at a young age because, you know, we build habits quite young. So, um, you know, always just remember that small acts can make a difference for the better. So thank you guys. Thanks, Jalen. Uh, great job. Um, let's hear some questions. I think the way that you designed this, especially aimed towards kids, was extremely successful with having like the characters and like the different point systems and then thinking about the your safety. So I think that was like really well thought out. So good job there. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have any thoughts about expanding this into like physical deliverable items at, at all? Maybe like, yes. uh, oh. yeah. Sorry. No, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought um, I thought about having uh, it could be so kind of like the supply list of um, of like prizes that you can unlock. So things that would help with the pickup, such as like a reusable bag. Um, if you needed like walking shoes or gloves, um, you'd be able to like unlock those in the app, and they would just have like some of the pickup branding on them. So if you wanted to like use your points to unlock like physical items that would help. Um, you could do that in like with your points and stuff. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks guys. Megan, you're up next. Hello. 
my name is Megan Forster. Um, my thesis project is centered around the topic of gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a practice intended to increase a political party, uh, increase power to a political party by manipulating district boundaries. The goal is to draw boundary lines of legislative districts so that as many seats as possible are likely to be won by a party's candidate. Um, this issue leaves an opportunity to educate younger generations on gerrymandering through a board game that can be found interesting and engaging. Voters who don't know about gerrymandering may also find the game to be a useful educational tool. Two principal tactics uh, are used in gerrymandering. Cracking, which means to dilute the voting power of uh, the opponent's voters across many districts. And packing, which refers to concentrating the opponent's voting power in fewer districts to reduce their voting power in other districts. In addition to manipulating electoral results for a particular party, Gerrymandering also serves as a tool for disenfranchising a political demographic. In 2016, one in five black voters were disenfranchised by gerrymandering, while one in 20 non-black voters were. The term gerrymandering comes from an American politician and governor of Massachusetts named Elbridge Gerry, uh, actually pronounced Gary, um, who went on to be the fifth vice president of America under James Madison in 1813. He signed a bill in 1812 that created a partisan um, district in the Boston area that was compared to the shape of a mythological salamander. Hence the name gerrymandering was created through a mashup of his name pronounced incorrectly as Jerry and the word salamander. In order to come up with the gameplay, I needed to do thorough research into the topic. So I created a mind map of words and images uh, to gather my ideas, concepts, and inspiration. Because the gerrymandering process begins with the census, which occurs every 10 years and assigns voters to a geographical location, I wanted to um, have the map to my game have unlimited possibilities as far as the layout during the setup process. I began my initial sketches using simple square shapes, but soon transitioned to the hexagon shape. I found myself really inspired um, by other board games like Risk, Acquire, and Catan. The hexagon being a tessellating shape allows one to fit in another perfectly while also allowing up to six sides of contact and is easily broken into triangular segments. The gameplay development was one of the most difficult parts of the process where I found myself constantly writing and rewriting the rules because gerrymandering is a process done by the elected state legislators every 10 years, I had to find a way to make the player playable for two players. I also had to do thorough research on what it takes uh, to make a board game, including things like game mechanics, um, for example, shuffling cards or rolling dice, um, rules and victory conditions, as well as what pieces I would need for the game. I also had to consider what kind of first impression I wanted the user to have. Um, so the color scheme was an important part of the design. I could have stuck with the typical Democrat blue and Republican red, but I wanted the user to feel free of any political pressures on the game. Testing became an important part of development. So I had to create a simple mock-up after writing the rules of the gameplay, I briefly explained them to a couple of people and allowed um, them to play while I observed. This was a very useful process because the testers were able to raise questions I hadn't thought of yet, and I was able to include all useful information in the game instructions. The next step of the process was finding materials. Um, I knew that I needed a softwood for the laser cutter that I would use to cut the game board and pieces. I also needed bags for the game pieces and a set of dice. Um, the colors would be painted on the pieces and 
they would ideally fit one into another. I created a 3D render as sort of a proof of a concept and learned how to make a 3D mockup in the process. For the game identity, I wanted to work on the idea of the hexagon. So I made a grid from hexagons broken down into triangles and began building letter forms for my identity. I decided to name my board game Triumph, uh, which means to achieve a victory. I think it perfectly reflects the theme of the game as the player is trying to triumph over the uh, op opponent as reflected in real life gerrymandering. Legislators want to draw district boundaries in a way that favors their party's candidates um, and assigns them more electoral votes. With the grid, I created several iterations of the letter forms before finally landing on my identity. Um, for the box, I decided I wanted to do a pizza box format and on the cover, I went with a hexagonal pattern um, with oranges and teals um, since I was trying to stay away from reds and blues. For the game instructions, I wanted them to be on the inside cover of the box. Um, so uh, to kind of replace the need for like a separate instruction booklet. So here's a final mock-up of the package the game would come in, including the four color design um, and the instructions clearly visible on the inside cover. The setup begins with the players taking turns drawing population tiles from the bag and placing them on the board at random. The use of strategy shouldn't be used at this point. The goal of the setup is to create a unique map with every new game. Because there are 52 population tiles and 80 available spaces on the board, the players can create different shapes with the board every time. I had to consider the statistics and probabilities of rolling dice and landing on certain numbers. Rolling a 7 is a lot more likely than rolling a 2 or a 12, so I had to number the tiles accordingly. Um, so the likelihood of rolling the dice and landing on a number on the board was higher. Population tiles are evenly split between the two teams. Um, and they represent registered voters in that geographical location. Turn sequence in the game begins with players on one team rolling the dice and adding the sum. Players then find the population tile on the board with the corresponding number. The player then takes their board, border piece and places it on the tile of their choosing. To create a district, players must have four contiguous or touching tiles. As in gerrymandering, there are certain rules legislators have to follow when, jerry, or when drawing district lines. In order to create a district, legislators are required to have their boundaries contiguous as well. Once a player has four touching borders, they can then close the district off by placing their team's district markers inside their borders. They are also allowed to draw a margin of error token at random, which allows the players to redeem uh, them during their dice roll. Margin of error tokens can only be used once and allow the player to add or subtract the number on their dice roll. These tokens reflect the margin of error in the total number of votes cast for a candidate during an election cycle. Players can dis disenfranchise their opponent by stealing a tile not in an established district. Once all possible spaces are filled, the player with the most district markers on the board wins. The player goes through the process of gerrymandering by weakening their opponent in order to put themselves in a better position. Players practice the tactics of cracking and packing to disenfranchise their opponents parties, voters. What Triumph represents is a strategic and dishonest system our government goes through to quite literally divide people um, and disenfranchise voters, especially members of marginalized cultural groups. I hope Triumph can educate, again, younger generations and voters and convince them to become engaged and aware of what our elected officials are currently allowed to do. So that's Triumph.
Thank you for listening. Thanks, Megan. Great job. Thank you. Do we have any questions? How many times did you have to go through and play this to get the rules all figured out? I I played it a lot in the beginning. I probably played it more with the mock-up than I did with like the actual final product. Um, just like a lot of different iterations of the game. Um, some rewriting of the rules, like I said. Um, I probably can't say for sure how many times, but a lot. <laughs> Um, how long did it make you to um, physically make the wood uh, piece of your game? I actually had um, someone at Western um, use a laser cutter to cut it for me. So um, it just took a few days for that process to be done. Um, and then it was just a matter of me like gluing the pieces together and sanding and staining and painting. And that probably took... Um, a couple of weeks total. I have a question about the board too. Are the the pieces itself from that same piece of wood like in the board so they fit perfectly or did you have to like construct separate pieces to fit in there? Yeah, so um, the way the laser cutter worked, I just had to make like a simple two-dimensional drawing, um, line drawing, and so I did have um, hexagons inside of hexagons inside of hexagons, and I kept all those pieces that I then used for the game pieces. So, yeah, <laughs> all at the same time. I really like that uh, sketch where you had the, the name shown in a bunch of variations, and it, it seemed really appropriate for the concept of gerrymandering because it was like the same area but like rearranged in different ways was that intentional and did you think about like applying different versions of the logo in different spots i hadn't thought about that i guess <laughs> was that just a happy accident Can that kind of meaning yeah all right Thanks, Megan. Great job. Thank you. We have Alex next. All righty. So let me start this up. Oh. All right. Can everyone see it? See. All right, so here's my senior thesis and it's called Simple Sex. So to start off, I want to talk about Michigan Public Schools current sex education. And here I have a list of all the things that they're actually required to teach to public school students. And the list isn't very long and also the fact that there is the option that each district can choose and pick what they can actually teach their students creates an like, inconsistency all throughout the state which is like a big problem when it comes to like people getting their education. So a comprehensive sex education would have all of these different topics, including like consent, um, biological sex, personal safety, menstruation, be age appropriate, medically accurate, um, to dive into gender expression, identity, healthy relationships, sexuality, um, parent responsibility, and all those different topics and like everything that's actually a part of it. So this list keeps on going and it kind of just really shows the difference between the Michigan public schools versus of actual like good comprehensive sex education the student deserves. So talking about like their current problem again, it's like the inconsistency of education and what they're actually teaching their students, the lack of information, they mainly focus on abstinence only and don't actually talk about sex like it isn't a real thing. And they don't talk about um, a lot of different types of sexualities and go in depth about the differences of like, yeah, they'll teach you refusal skills, but they won't teach you to ask first with consent. So there's just a lot of things like that. There are like little issues that could be solved with just like simple problems 
but then also like teachers don't need to be sex ed certified and just the list goes on and the last amendment that they made was in June 2004. So it's been a long time, obviously, so there needs to be some change and a lot more like inclusivity. So my thesis is how can sex ed become modernized and easier for students to receive a comprehensive education to prepare them for their adult lives. So my audience, again, um, it's going to be middle schoolers. That's the age range I decided to focus on because sex education is such a big topic. I needed to kind of narrow down what I was going to focus on. So I chose some topics that would fit these students. And then the message would be that sex education shouldn't be skipped on and that the kids of our future are preparing like for success. So the Michigan Department of Education should really be putting in the effort to make it known that their education is worth it and they're important. So the goals with my project, I wanted to make a guidebook that would be more like informing the students, helping them learn tolerance and respect, um, helping create safer environments for everyone. Um, everyone being like actually having a sex education book that doesn't just feature heterosexual relationships and then kind of helping people, especially if they're confused in a time when their feelings are fluctuating in puberty to help like find themselves and figure out who they are. So the topics of choice I chose were sex, gender and attraction to focus on and I eventually in the future want to plan on doing a different little book for each kind of generalized section of sex education. But I kind of took inspiration from the categories like the gender bred person, which is an ambiguous kind of way to represent everyone and like kind of show the differences in the areas. So I really found a lot of inspiration from this, but like there's only a lot of like updated information and they only give you so much. So I wanted to definitely dive deeper into that aspect. So here's my research and design process. Um, I started off doing a lot of visual research and going to lots of programs and websites that were definitely sex ed positive, not mainly towards like schools, but websites where they could go to and get information on their own outside and then different resources. And then I did a lot of research with figuring out what was missing from sex education of prior students that have already graduated and like hearing their take on it. I was able to interview a friend of mine who's a part of the transgender community and hearing his side was like a really good insight onto what was missing and how uninclusive the current system is. So I wanted to definitely go on that. So here's a research map of all the writing, which this was a heavily researched project because I wanted to make sure everything was the most current and accurate it could be. So here's everything sectioned out with the different sections of sex education that I categorized as sexual orientation, gender, puberty, healthy relationships, personal safety, STDs, HIV, among other things. So I decided to go between those two and then go between having gender to biological sex, gender identity and gender expression. And then I would go into what actually attraction is and then explain the different types of sexual orientation. So from there, I started doing some sketching and like different cover design layouts and ways that I could project it and be fun and not as clinical as a lot of educational things can sometimes get, especially when it comes to sex education. So I started doing like a layout design and then figuring out the direction of how I wanted to display the information. So I decided to kind of go in the flow of having it start off explaining biological sex and then morphing into talking about gender and the topics under that and then into attraction and sexuality so that you could get a grasp for the basic concepts and kind of follow like a trail to like the end goal. So here's my really beginning early like sketches of the cover and I ended up liking the one that I had with the person kind of like telling like a secret because like a lot of people think sex is like a taboo topic and don't want to talk about it. So I was like, well, it could be kind of fun to like play off of that and just kind of like bring more intrigue and like creativity to like aspire to be something for kids. So I went and did that and I had a talk with Mary Freuder, who was amazing and helped me a lot with like figuring out what would be best to put in this guidebook and like the best way to be inclusive. And the fact that having the word sex on the cover could possibly be like something to deter people from wanting to like look at it because they don't want to own something that says sex right out like in the front. 
So having like a little surprise, I was thinking about the fact that if you open the cover, it would say simple sex, like with the actual word instead of the triple X's. So I started to um, go more into the direction of where I end up at, and I figured out to do a bright color scheme. And my main two colors were gonna be this bright yellow and pink, and then started trying to create my own like kind of symbolist system and typeface because I took um, I think it was very X um, and then I edited it to make the X and that was the basis for all my other letters and symbols. So I started off with trying to figure out that the X would stand for sex, the heart would stand for attraction, and the little circle O would stand for gender and identity in that because it's kind of the basis of every gender symbol. So I wanted to have all three of those incorporated in the cover and make sure that was good. So I started then going into doing some more digital sketches for like the actual inside. And at first I thought I was gonna go in the direction of including characters, but then I realized that it could be almost not inclusive to have just specific types of people. And then I didn't wanna like have anyone missing out and like someone to feel like they couldn't relate to it or there was gonna be an issue where they just couldn't see themselves as the people in the book. So I decided again, stick with my symbolage and keep it very simple and like to the point. But I started doing some anatomical drawings here. And then these are my really early um, symbols for the biological sex. And that was pretty fun. So I was able to draw these ones on Procreate. And then I started going into like figuring out color wise cause the pink was too like fleshy and almost like two clinicals then still so then I was thinking about breaking the stereotypical colors of not having like a pink and like a blue be for male and female but having more of a like reddish orange like a turquoise and then I also include like intersex so that I have a chart that doctors would use to categorize where people are in like biological sex and I tried to make it as like inclusive and also point out to the fact that there is no normal when it comes to sex education and a person's body and gender and how they look. So there isn't really a specific of what you should aspire to have with your um, appearance. So again, going more into like my actual sketches, I brought them into Photoshop for that. And I wanted to create kind of like a depth, like a little bit of a 3D pattern. So I got that in there. And then again, with my symbol system, I ended up creating all these different symbols to represent the different sexualities and genders based off of symbols that are already currently in place, but my own version of them. So I was happy to finally get like a system for that. Oh, it's not, there we go. Sorry, my little thingy got stuck. Anyways, final result. <laughs> this is my simple sex book. And so here's some cut pictures of the actual product put together in like a guide. And then I kind of decided to like, have it where I'd have like the person interacting with it so they could see like going through it. So then each spread, like again, when you open it, you go from the beginning and then it's in the same spot, but it has the word sex and you get like an interest of what it actually is. And so you understand the guidebook. And then I took the symbols and I was using it as kind of like a reoccurring theme that I could use throughout when I did different sections and like headers or separating the sections. So here I chose the, for the contents to keep it with the title. And then I focused in on like biological sex, what gender is, gender identity, pronouns, expression, attraction, sexuality, and like a conclusion. So I introduced, I started with my own introduction and here I decided to um, keep with having what the next section would be as the pattern logo to go on the side. So like I had with the PAPS page with the O, the X and the heart, this one would be the biological sex symbols. So having that as a pattern, I went in and created um, this spread that would show the difference between like what biological sex is and explain that it is different than gender and kind of just break down how doctors assign babies their sex at birth. Ooh, two minutes. All right, so <laughs> then I went into what actually gender was and started to include those symbols and add in the new pattern. And I was able to create some spreads that would go further into talking about different gender identities and what it means and breaking down those definitions and including all the symbols that can be used to address them. And then going in and talking about different kinds of pronouns people can use to further extend and express their gender identity. And then also talking about different kinds of expression 
and then moving on to going to attraction, which I took the symbols and kind of put them together in the groups of how it relates to what type of sexuality is attracted to who romantically or sexually. So going through that one, I was able to create another cool pattern. This one was definitely a lot more difficult than the others since the sizes of the symbols were a little different and they have little parts sticking out and down. But working through that, I was pretty happy with the result. And then I also chose to like keep some color in and not do a stark white background by choosing the colors that I used on the page and creating an abstract form and messing with it in Photoshop to create kind of that cool part in the background that's just something a little fun to keep kids more interested and like not be again on the clinical side. And then I included a conclusion to kind of wrap up the general idea of having um, respect and tolerance. And I added a section in about notes and thoughts because these are topics that um, everyone's going through and it's personal and unique and everyone has different questions and feelings. So sometimes it's okay to like maybe write that down and helpful for kids in that way. But uh, so, well, my last slide isn't working, but it says thank you. So that is my senior thesis. Great job, Alex. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my computer. I'll go back to the front. Um, what do you think the biggest takeaway or the most important thing that you learned from this project was? I think it was that uh, I was super undereducated when it came to sex education when I went through high school and middle school. So thinking about that and then realizing how much the culture, like cultural and societal changes that there are and how it's the currently evolving subject that constantly needs to be updated was like the biggest thing I learned. So diving into that and trying to make sure that everyone, like every spot, like not going to too much depth where it would be confusing for obviously like middle schoolers, but like the general idea and trying to get everything included and like make them feel like they're getting the right information and proper information. You what mentioned you that, you know, this kind of information is always changing. Do you think you would do like um, every year there would be a new like edition? Like this is the 2021 edition, but maybe like next year there would be a 2022 like pamphlet. Yeah, I really like that idea. It was kind of like I wanted to like in the future, I want to create each section under it. So I'd have like every guidebook designed like defining different aspects of sex education. But yeah, there would be like a system where every like one to two years where it could be like updated so that the most current valued information could be given to the students providing that consistent education. What do you think your next steps would be as far as putting this into practice and getting it into classrooms? Well, it's a two year process to actually get in front of the school department of education sex ed board. So there's um, definitely a lot you have to go through a few different meetings beforehand and get in contact with parents, um, sex ed groups within each school district, and then present it to a pre board and then to the actual board. So it's a lot of legality stuff that I have to look into, but I am thinking if I can like make the other ones and have like a full system that it would be worth it to like do that and try and like advocate for better sex education for all students. So Alex, you, you uh, talk, talked with Mary Floyd or maybe she can help you on that process because she's has quite a bit of experience with a variety of topics, not just this, yeah. but with communities. And uh, she's, she's more awesome. than happy to help. Yeah, she's really good yeah. and very, yeah, she's great. Okay, yeah. So um, it, the important thing, and I, I wanna say this for anybody, but, uh, is that after you have a project that you want to continue, and we talked about this a little bit further, don't just put it away in a box. You're yeah. gonna, I know you're going out for job hunting and 
you're going to be busy doing other things. And um, the important thing is if you really don't forget it, you know, it may not, you may not be able to do something like right away and get action, but over time. Okay. Yeah. And then even Thanks. with like Mary, Great. she was um, super helpful and like said that she would mentor me over the summer and like we could go over it so I could keep expanding it and like get her feedback throughout like the whole process. Yeah. And I was like, thank you so much. So that's in the works. Great. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. You guys all did great. We're doing great. Thanks, Alex. All right. Thank you. All right, Maria, you're next. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so. Hello, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for joining in today to listen to mine and perhaps some of my colleagues' thesis projects. Uh, my name is Maria Cedor. I am from small town Bear Lake, Michigan, where the population as of 2019 is approximately 203 people. I moved to the big city of Kalamazoo to attend WMU in 2017, where the population here is approximately 76,000. Well, to me, that's a big city. To my friends from Detroit, it's hardly a fraction of the size. Although most of us came here for the same reason, Kalamazoo is more of a college city, more than a college city, and has a lot to offer. The problem is the city logo does not express that. Currently, Kalamazoo's logo appears dated and hard to read. You can see here that the logo has two ideas at one time with a portion knocked out or inversed, if you may. It is also potentially, it is also partially a script typeface, whereas others may say cursive, which actually is no longer being taught in the public school system, making it appear even more dated. Now imagine this logo on top of a photo. You will find it is even more difficult to read. This example here is a screenshot from the city website, and this is most often how I have seen their logo being used. As a designer, I understand how badly this needed a revamp. So for my thesis, I made these goals. To create an identity that Kalamazoo as a city would be proud of, to match the energy and diversity of the community, to encourage tourism, to be modern and long lasting, and to be easily read across print and digital media at any size. So I began my project by reaching out to Dion Mixon. Uh, Dion uh, had presented to our class a few times before and is a WMU alumni. I remembered his big project of designing a flag to represent the Detroit people. If you recall, there are about 675,000 residents. He gave me great advice on how to represent such a large community and also spoke to me about how to make the design real by, by presenting it to the city board members. He encouraged me to constantly address Kalamazoo's residents and what best represents them. He noted the Roman Mars TED Talk and podcast. I'll talk more about that later. But overall, I recommend, he recommended that I talk to the people of Kalamazoo directly. Given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, I took the next best route and created an online survey. In this survey, I asked if the person had lived in Kalamazoo before, for how long, is there something that best represents Kalamazoo, and what do you think of when you hear Kalamazoo? Another important question I asked was their ethnicity as I wanted to be inclusive. My results concluded pretty similar to my personal beliefs. Kalamazoo is a diverse town full of boutiques, bars, parks, art, and education. It has nightlife and a family-friendly atmosphere and is described as quirky, eccentric, and busy. From here, I decided to look into the physical things Kalamazoo has to offer by taking a trip downtown. At this point, my eyes were focused most on the typography, but also taking in any repetitive styles or designs Kalamazoo has to offer. I realized quickly that Kalamazoo has an emphasis on Art Deco style. 
I tried painting my own logo type for Kalamazoo based off the typography found downtown with a modern take of the Art Deco style. When comparing my paintings to the survey results of what Kalamazoo is to its residents, I found that it was not working. I realized that the logo type alone is not going to capture all of Kalamazoo and what it has to offer. And um, going off the Art Deco style was going to make my logo stay dated. At this point, I dug into the history of Kalamazoo and potentially why it encompasses the Art Deco style so much. I reached out to some of the people at the local library and, list and visited the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. At the museum, I found that Kalamazoo was booming through the 1920s, the same time period as Art Deco. The city's success led to a number of new buildings at this time, such as the Fifth Third Bank and the City Hall. All of this was due to Kalamazoo's large celery industry, paper industry, and the upcoming of Gibson Guitars. I believe the amount of success at this period was a huge point of history and maybe why downtown has a preservation of this period's aesthetic. In my readings from the library, I found the deeper history of Kalamazoo. Its ground was first walked on by mound builders who created these geometrical raised garden beds. There is a single mound preserved in Bronson Park to this day, as photographed in the background here. Then, two Native American tribes, the Potawatomi, who called the land Kukanamasuk, and the Ojibwe, who called it Kikanamasu. These translate to boiling pot or kettle, referring to the eddies in the river that made it a great spot for fishing. In 1829, Titus Bronson built home on the land and became the founder of what Kalamazoo is today. After all this history, I needed some modern imagery. I was inspired by the former studio Thirst run by Rick Valsenti, who created this project for Columbus. When I met with him, I realized I was misled in that the branding was for an event and not Columbus, the city itself. Many locals though have adopted the identity because it has been liked so much. Rick helped direct me to telling a story with a new identity. He helped me figure the roots of Kalamazoo's history and recognize today people still people call it Kazoo, even the non-locals. He reassured the identity will be successful if it works on all skills and items such as t-shirts, hats, postcards, or billboards. I then went back to playing with typography and experimenting with how it can work with a deeper history. When the mark transitioning to type wasn't working, I started working with type alone. I added different typefaces to represent the diversity, but it appeared too chaotic. I also worked with emphasizing the name Kazoo rather than Kalamazoo to express this new era of a name. I then tried playing with a single typeface, but the angles on the K, the A, and the Z were creating a wonky negative space. I warped the letters and created my own to fit for Kazoo, removing the letters A, L, M as we have done phonetically. Which brings me to my final mark in black and white. I had struggled a bit with color, so I reached out to WMU alumni Connor Donro, who designed the 10, 10 state seals and flags for his own thesis last year. He directed me to using colors that had meaning to Kalamazoo, not just the ones you see here that are simply pairing well together, which was kind of how I started. Like the transition up to Kikanami Souk to Keizu, I used colors inspired by the city's history. Blue for the river running through it, green for the nickname Celery City, and red for the once potential name Cranberry Center. Here I have a comparison of my new version and the old version. Both Connor and Dion helped me realize that a flag is a great way for residents to express their home, so I created a flag with a new identity, following Roman, Roman Mars rules of flag design. Keep it simple, use meaningful symbolism, use three basic colors, no lettering or seals of any kind, and be distinctive. As you can see, the current Kalamazoo flag is not following any of those. So here is what I came up with, matched with the older version. I wanted to show you guys all of the different backgrounds that could potentially be for the flag. Um, as we live in Kalamaz as we live in Michigan, we know we see different skies throughout the day all the time. Um, another part of city branding is creating an official city seal. I wanted to design something that was eye catching but not too playful, as a seal is used for official and professional reasons. 
I decided on this as it came to be the most professional, clean, and readable version. Here I have it mocked up in a meeting room in full color. I also mocked it up on renderings of the new government building currently being built in downtown at this moment. This here is a north courtroom. And this here is a um, is the clerk lobby. And this here is a version of the more everyday use of a stamp. When researching successful city brands, I came across the city Porto. I was inspired by the simple icons that showed different activities Porto has to offer and its integration into the environment. I challenged myself in doing something similar for Kalamazoo. My goal here was to illustrate Kalamazoo's friendly atmosphere when marketing in order to boost tourism. It also is a fun way of expressing the rich history here. Those from here may be able to recognize some illustrations, such as the Water Tower, East Hall, Fifth Third Bank. Others may also recognize Gibson Guitars, the Breweries, and the Checkered Cab. I did experiment with these illustrations being in different styles. Although the style on the right may be more structured and clean to match the logo, I felt it didn't, I felt it didn't match the energy of Kalamazoo. I chose the hand-drawn style, um, mostly to the right side, to make the logo pop and to express the quirky, artsy, and fun adjectives people use when answering the survey before. Again, I struggled with color, so I reached out to alumni Kelly Brandon, who gave great feedback on my thesis progress and showed ideas on in integrating color. We concluded on this. I used the red here to represent the well-known architecture. Green is for the items that have a historical impact on Kalamazoo, and the blue is for the current items that many also describe in the survey. Now I have examples of this in use. Um, I picture it being in use as on construction sites. A lot of sites will block out what they're building, um, but I didn't want it to drag the attention away from caution. I also picture it on a um, trifold uh, brochure, mostly at Michigan Info Centers. And then a billboard when you are entering Kalamazoo. And then I have another billboard without it for when you are in Kalamazoo. Last but not least, I did create a short animation for a quick history and, and an introduction of a new identity. So I'm going to stop sh sharing for a second and um, reshare. Overall, I have learned to expand beyond my own beliefs of something when designing, to embrace what works and to learn from what doesn't, and even if the research stage is time consuming, trust the process. I feel I created a great story and history lesson for us all. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Maria. Great job. Um, Questions for Maria. Um, on more of a technical thing, but on my end, I only sort of caught the tail end of that animation. I wonder if oh. anyone uh, else had that problem. I did not have that problem, but I could play it again if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. please.
I think that animation does such a good job of showing the evolution of Kalamazoo and then how it came to be this sort of more fun, quirky, artsy, modern city. So really nice job. Thank you. Yeah, also with the uh, with the animation on, I think it was the, the blue text, how you kind of twisted the letters around. Um, I thought that was just a really interesting visual element that you did to kind of like show the transition between words and like how they, you know, kind of telephone through dialect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have plans to bring this to the city? I would love to, um, especially with them building a new building at this moment. I think it would be a great time. Um, I know in past critiques, you said, hey, COVID's over. You should come visit. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that'd be awesome too. Cool. I didn't know like with the color system that you had that it would represent like the different parts of like Kalamazoo. And I really think that was a really interesting touch and really good use of that like color system. So that's really cool. Definitely move forward with it. Um, there'll probably be a couple different avenues that you can use to be able to make this um, people interested from mm -hmm. the community. So I think that's one of the, the most important things is get out there and sort of, I don't want to say sell it, but, you know, promote it. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, Michelle, you're up next. Yeah, my, uh, I'm having some connection issues. I think that's probably why Kelton's video didn't show because mine didn't either. So, I'm going to turn my camera off while I'm presenting so it doesn't cause any issues if that's all right okay okay hello my name is michelle revelette and my thesis project is called paralympics 2036 identity what is an identity system? An identity system is a set of visual elements that an organization uses to communicate their brand, such as graphic imagery, a color system, fonts, and a logo, which give the, which give the organization a personality. I have designed an identity system for the Summer Paralympics of 2036. It is fictionally set in Iceland's capital Reykjavik, and I have focused on brand identity through logo design, pictogram design, wayfinding, metal design, merch design, and employee uniform design. My goal is to accurately merge the cultures of Iceland and para-athletes, as well as inform and direct international attendees on how to navigate an unfamiliar space. It wasn't until 1976 that the first Paralympic Summer Games was televised which was 16 years after Paralympics first took place. And although society has made some progress in equality and inclusion for professional athletes with disabilities since then, I think it's important for the momentum to continue. In 2021, we still have issues with inclusion, such as non-ADA compliance, social inequality, and lack of representation. Although a designer can't guarantee ease, can't guarantee ease for every single participant, the goal should be to get as close as they can by performing research and getting in the headspace of their end users. So that lends me to the question, how can I appropriately represent a location as well as a range of disabilities and sports through the identity design of an international event? Since this is a global and televised event, the participants and audience will consist of people from a wide range of backgrounds such as race, language, disability, gender, etc. Some challenges for those with disabilities in an event such as this include being able to reach, read, and understand wayfinding, find their destination, and locate help when they need it. As a designer, it's my job to find solutions to these problems for people that are disabled and non-disabled without separating the two. 
In this way, my designs will establish a sense of inclusion rather than separate experiences for different people. I want society to understand that para-athletes are professional athletes and should be represented for their strength and resilience at the same level as non-disabled athletes. The first step in this project was to determine where this event is going to be set. I began by looking at all Paralympic host cities in the past and chose a range of cities that weren't on the list. I created a mood board that listed these cities and allowed me to compare imagery from each, such as art colors, people, and landscape. From there, I thought of how I would use this imagery as inspiration for an identity. I noticed that Iceland has unique landscapes and strong traditions, so that's where I began my focus. I then created a mood board for Iceland and started doing deeper research into its history and culture, learning that it is a safe and popular tourist destination. From this, I deduced that the main ideas and topics I needed to reflect in this identity were harmony, peace, progressive society, traditional craft, and the Northern Lights. After choosing the location, I created a mind map that helped me make connections between different aspects such as location, wayfinding, disabilities, representation, and attendees. Starting with umbrella terms, I generated more specific words and ideas to think about this project in new ways. This helped me produce important questions that would direct my research later. I also made an image survey that centers around disabled athletes and how to visualize them under different perspectives. Subjective views are those that have an emotion and an emotional influence, so I went with discrimination against those that have a disability. Micro-level views are lesser known areas, in this case being the athlete's focus. Metaphoric views use symbolism, in this case the idea of an athlete being multifaceted. Macro-level views are more well-known areas, in this case winning. Literal views are what is absolute, in this case what you can expect to see at the event and objective views are fact-based, in this case, knowledge surrounding a person's disability. I then began to find inspiration from Lance Wyman's book, The Monograph, to visualize the range in which an identity can reach into areas such as icon design and wayfinding to create a cohesive family of applications and elements. I used Yusa Kukami, Yusa Kukami Kura, as a, as a resource and was inspired by his powerful abstract logos that focus online. Otto Eicher designed pictograms for 1972 Munich Olympics and I was able to understand and apply a similar process as far as using a grid structure and having a kit of parts for spacing and sizing of icon elements. During the sketching process for the Reykjavik logo, I aim to reflect each of the main ideas I learned about Iceland and move from hand sketches to digital sketches. I then chose to combine a few of the sketches I'd done to create my overlapping concentric diamond designs. This is meant to reflect harmony as well as the volcanoes and mountains prevalent to Iceland. I experimented with number of lines as well as positive and negative forms. I wanted a typeface for Reykjavik that resembled the Viking runes present in Iceland's Nordic traditions. The one I initially found was too rounded for my graphic, so I used it as a reference to create my own font that was more geometric. I also looked into fonts to pair it with for the words Paralympic Games. I settled on a geometric sans serif font to contrast and harmonize with my Reykjavik font. The next step was exploring color combinations for the logo that mirrored the landscape of Iceland. I found a professional photographer on Instagram that took photos of Iceland's landscape, and that was my init initial means of color inspiration. And this is only a small portion of a wide range of color combinations I experimented with, which was around 50 or so. I settled on red and blue for the main colors as they were variants of the colors on Iceland's flag, but also represented volcanoes and mountains. I added a third neutral beige for the background as well. I created a huge number of logo iterations, changing text location, breaking up the year, experimenting with how I applied the color and altering the graphic form. So again, this is a small section that re represents the range I pushed during this part of the process. 
In my final logo, I got rid of the third neutral color in the graphic and instead applied a gray color to the smaller text. Once, the de once this design was finalized, I laid out guidelines for this brand. I showcased the main logo, colors, typography for headers, subheads, and body copy, Logo variations and alternative color logo options were also important to display because different applications may require different orientations. I also set rules in the case of events that the elements of the logo need to be separated. Once this section of my project was completed, I moved on to my next task, pictogram sketching. I worked through multiple versions of each sport to reach a set of icons that was limited to shapes with 45 degree angles, 90 degree angles, in addition to circles only when necessary. And there were 23 sports total. After selecting the best from my sketches, I reconstructed each icon in a way that followed a grid structure as well as rules for spacing and sizing of icon elements. I contained each icon inside of a diamond shape to push the identity even further. My goal was to elicit a sense of movement and strength while incorporating different adaptation elements, such as wheelchairs, blindfolds, and running blades. It's important that these adaptation elements be included but not emphasized so that the athlete and sport can take the attention rather than the disability. I developed graphic assets that follow the brand and could be used throughout my system. I began by using the assets on the on event merch, and I carefully selected items that would be used in an athletic setting, including a baseball cap, lanyard, backpack, water bottle, and enamel pin for the backpack. These items could be for athletes or attendees as ways to remember their experience at the games. I also used these graphic assets in the uniforms I designed for three different types of employees, first aid, mobility support, and media staff. The first aid is easily recognizable with the main color being red. Mobility support stands out with the bright blue color, and since media should exist in the background of what's going on, I decided to make its primary color a light gray as to not attract attention. I chose a long sleeve quarter zip sweater and long jogger pants because even during the summer months in Reykjavik, the average temperatures are only around 55 degrees. The purpose of wayfinding is to inform, direct, and guide people who are unfamiliar with an environment without over-designing or over-complicating. When designing for the Paralympics, I had to keep the design inclusive because, like I said before, as soon as there are two different versions of something, such as high and low viewing options for people of different heights, you are separating those people and then essentially creating two separate experiences. The first level of wayfinding would stand as the large or broader directional wayfinding. The large red cube with an eye on top helps people recognize it as a source of information. Aside from the light patterns on the structure, everything is tactile. If a person with a visual impairment isn't familiar with braille, they can still feel the lever letter forms labeled for the sport, but I've still included braille directly beneath the letter forms. The map is also tactile, so those with visual impairments are able to feel where they need to go. The second level of wayfinding gets more specific. For example, if you follow the, area, the arrows pointing right from the first level of wayfinding, it would take you to this area and get more precise on where to go next. It remains the same height and color as the first level so that it's e easily recognizable as directional signage. After pulling images of Olympic and Param Paralympic medals created in the past, I listed what design elements I found interesting and incorporated them into my hand sketches. Thank you. Um, sticking with my identity system, I leaned towards diamonds, squares, 45 and 90 degree angles, and repeating lines. I challenged myself to learn Adobe Dimension so I could show the entirety of the metal's 3D form in a realistic manner. Again, I focused on a tactile design so that visually impaired athletes can have the same experience as non-visually impaired athletes, and each medal will showcase the sport in which they placed. 
Through working on this project, I have learned the importance of research in the design process. In order to get the perspective of the end user, I needed to learn all I could about who they are, what their obstacles are, and what gets them excited. I had a chance to talk to a Paralympic athlete as well during my research process, and he gave me a lot of insight on, on all of those things, on their obstacles and what gets them excited and, and what, what has been missed in um, past Paralympic events or looked over in past Paralympic events. So that helped me a lot. Um, so I now have an understanding that disability is just another subset of demographics like gender, race, and language that should always be considered in design. The most difficult aspect of my thesis project has been its scope. I challenged myself to create an identity system that is extensive with a wide range of applications and with the right time management and organization, I've been able to create a system that is cohesive, accessible, and informative. Thank you. Great job, Michelle. Thank you. Um, questions for Michelle? Are you um, possibly going to like maybe reset or sorry, reach out again to that contact and like show him like the final results? Yeah, there's a there's a few people that I've reached out to for you know our consultants and stuff like that mm -hmm. that I told them that I'd show them it when it was done. So yes, that's on my list. Cool, and I also um, want to congratulate you. I loved the wayfinding system and how inclusive you were with it and like thinking about every aspect. Thank you. I think that really was successfully designed. Thank you. I think your medals came out really nice too. I was just curious um, as to your decision making as far as going with sort of a modular system with that square and then with the sport rather than like a medal for every single sport. You know what I mean? That bad boy? Yep, that bad boy. What's your question? Uh, how come you decided to go with that square on top of the medal to do the sport rather than just having a, a medal for every single one? Um, I thought it kind of created a more uh, personalized experience, I guess. Um, and I saw it in Pat. I see. I've seen it in one past medal, and I really like the idea that it, it it really feels like yours and like it was your event. And yeah, I like that idea a lot. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, next we have Kelly. All right. Just one moment here. Okay, let's get this all set up here. Does it look, how do I get rid of this? Oh, there we go. Is there a way to get rid of this on top? I was trying to figure that out earlier. Yeah, you hit play. Oh, cool, thank you. All right, hey guys, I, oops. I am really excited to share my final thesis with you guys and the process behind my children's book. Words for a better and beautiful world. So why a children's book? Why did I decide to choose that as my thesis? Ever since I was little, literally when I was a baby, I was always told from my mom that I would crawl to books. That was just always my favorite thing to play with. Um, my twin sister in the back, you could see she was the one that was always getting up and moving around. I was more of a visual learner, very hands-on. And um, my inspiration behind this project is my mother. She is a creative person and 
I have a lot of fond memories with her reading to me as a child, so she definitely will always be an inspiration um, with my work, but especially this project. So for my thesis statement, ever since I was little, I was drawn to children's books. Children are very observant and curious. ABC books are a great tool to teach children the alphabet, but tend to lack meaning. What if I create a book that uses impactful words for children to learn? This book would explore important concepts of love, compassion, and hope all wrapped into one book. So these four books you see here were a huge inspiration for me when I was little, um, but also for this project. They all kind of represent confidence and finding yourself. So on the left there, that is Chrysanthemum. It's about a young little mouse trying to find confidence. She's not so sure about her name. She gets bullied and picked on, but by the end of the book, she finds herself. And then Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, it's just a fan favorite, I think for a lot of children, especially me when growing up. Very typographic and the geometric shapes and the colors really um, catch your eye. And then the bad case of the stripes is another one, a girl finding confidence um, in herself. And then Stand Tall, Molly Lou Mellon is another one of those books as well that I used to love growing up. So some inspiration um, that I took for my project was through a lot of female artists. This first one here is Danielle Sosa. Her illustrations are super fun and whimsical and it shows a great organic type and texture. It's really eye-catching and I love, you know, the different colors that she uses and the different elements in her work is really inspiring. The next one is Jeannie Espinoza. She's another talented artist. Her style is very bright and playful. Her figures are more exaggerated and highlight certain parts of someone's personality. So this little science, cute little scientist girl, you can really tell her personality in the way that she creates um, her drawings. And she also adds that texture too, which is really interesting as well to kind of give that hand-drawn look. The next one is Penelope Dulligan. Her style is very painterly, painterly and organic. I love her style. I love the kind of whimsical play she has um, with this one on the right hand side. It kind of captures your eye because you're like, wait a minute, this is a pie, um, not a balloon. So it's just that really interesting, playful approach that she does with her art that's really interesting and captivating. And the last female designer and artist that I was really drawn to is Liz Fang. Her art is really cool and it almost kind of has this unique approach, kind of like a letterpress kind of style to it. And it has a lot of really interesting textures and the color is what really captivated me as well. So these are the beginning sketches of this project. I really didn't know where I wanted to um, go with this and what kind of voice I wanted the book to have. And after a lot of sketches, I decided I wanted to include animals that aren't always used in ABC books, but then tie in some really meaningful words that can teach children an open conversation um, with their parents about important words, especially in 2020. In this, in 2021, you know, all the stuff that's going on, I think it's important to have these conversations with children and teach them important words. So this is the color palette I went with for this project. As you guys all know, I love color. So this was a really fun way to experiment and use all kinds of color because I have to do, you know, so many different letters. So I, I wanted to create a universal palette, but also give each spread something different and a different punch of color. So this is just an example of the beginning stage. I started off with just a illustration on Illustrator and it just seemed really flat. I, I didn't know what was missing. And then I went back to a lot of my drawings and back to you know what inspired me and 
it was really the texture and all those artists drawings that really, you know, drew me in. So I went back and I really experimented in Photoshop to really um, play around with that dimensional effect to give it that hand done look. So this is just an example of like the these two animals zoomed in with the textures. I wanted to give, you know, a dimensional approach to these animals and kind of give them a unique personality. So this is just an example of some of those textures I used. And then here is the front and back cover, which I will show towards the end as well on a mock-up. So I'm just going to go through this, um, all the letters for you real quick. And I'm curious by the end of this, what your favorite animal is um, in this alphabet book. I have a couple favorites, but I can't really decide on one. It was really fun. And see. Okay, so here is the mock-ups. It was really hard finding a good mock-up and I was really glad that I stumbled upon this one because children's books, um, especially when they're young, those cardboard books are awesome because if a kid spills on it or, you know, something happens, kids are really hard on things. This is a great book for that. You can wipe it down. You don't have to worry about, you know, the pages ripping or anything like that. So I thought this would be the perfect type of um, style of book that I would see myself if I were to publish this one day. That's the kind of book I think I would be going towards. And then I also wanted to experiment with tote bags because children lug around, you know, bags full of their books and school supplies. So I thought it'd be really fun to apply this on a book bag, something interesting and different than just the book. I wanted to have kind of like an overall um, series of different things that to, I could apply it towards. So on the left there would just be like a poster that you could have framed, a teacher could have it in their classroom or in a child's nursery or bedroom, it's really universal. Um, it's not, you know, that boring ABC um, poster you see in a classroom. And then on the right was a fun little idea I had with baby onesies, little world changers with two of my favorite illustrations that I created. Um, yeah, I thought it was kind of fun to tie that in as well because it's it's not just for little kids. I think this would be awesome for babies too because they are visual learners, um, which goes back to my pictures when I was little and I was just a baby there. So I thought it was kind of like a little tie in there. So I wanted to add the baby onesies. But that is my project. I want to thank you guys for listening and hearing all of my thought behind my project. This was such a fun project to do. It's something I've always wanted to create. So I am really happy with how it turned out. And thank you again for listening to my presentation. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Great job. Um, do we have questions for Kelly? Which animal is your favorite? Um, I think mine. Let, here, let's go back. Why is it not letting me go back? Uh, why am I not finding my way back here? I need help, guys. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here you go. Why, why am I stuck? Maybe try a view in like the corner. Or wait. I had an escape. Ah. 
Oh, the view on the left side, next to Zoom. Yeah, yeah. top left corner of the window there. The there we button. go. Um, I would say my favorite is probably the whale, but I have a couple favorites. But yeah, this was such a fun challenge too, because like I said, I'm not, I wasn't ever really like skilled in Photoshop. I didn't know how to use all the brushes and everything. So this taught me a lot um, because I've always wanted to do illustration like this. And I finally found my, my style and kind of the direction I want to move forward in the future, what type of design I would like to do. So, yeah. I'm curious to know like what your process for these textures was. Honestly, it was kind of trial and error and experimentation with the brushes. I downloaded all kinds of really unique brushes. It was just kind of a, like I said, like a trial and error. I would try one out um, and kind of see what would best fit that animal too. Um, yeah, it was really, dependent on that individual animal and what I thought would be interesting. And I try to make them all a little bit different too, not the same. So. The illustrations look great. Um, 26 pages in a board book would be super, super thick. Uh, Nowadays, they make these books that are unterrible that are on these like uh, fabric. It's almost like fabric paper. Uh, I can look it up and, and send you uh, a link to a publisher that uses that. But it really is like unbreakable books and they're super thin. Um, so it could accommodate uh, an entire alphabet book. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even consider like how thick that would be. But yeah, that would be really thick. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the way that you have all the letters and the pictures interacting and like feeling cohesive. I think you did a good job in like figuring out the texture because it feels like gives it that real like the feeling of like almost like the texture of the animal skin or it's pretty cool. Good job. Thank you. Do you see yourself going into more illustration-based work like this in your future? I see it being a part of what I do, but I definitely, because I'm so new to everything in design, I, I definitely want to do a little bit of everything, but it's definitely something I would specialize in in the future for sure. Uh, somebody in town you might want to connect with is Emily Kastner. She does the uh, nerdy baby books. Um, I think Paul knows her. Um, she's co-owner of Factory Coffee. Oh, cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we accidentally, I accidentally skipped Carolyn. Um, so that Carolyn's gonna go next and then we'll have uh, Maddie after that, so. It's okay, Ryan, I forgive you. Oh, I feel bad. Shit. <laughs> it's okay. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, cool. My name is Carolyn Wilson. Um, this is Taste Not Waste. I'm going to preface this with a little backstory before I go in to my project. So as a kid, my mom would never let me leave the dinner table with food left on my plate. I used to throw temper tantrums and make a scene without really understanding why it was a big deal. Uh, we ate leftovers for like half the week. We never went out to eat or anything like that. But now that I've grown up a little bit, I know why she made it a big deal. More food is being thrown out than we can even wrap our heads around. The problem with the food waste tragedy in the United States is that we're losing around 40% of our food supply at a time when hunger and food insecurity are growing. We can make enough food to feed the world, so where is it most of it going? So the food dating system and guidelines are contributing to the waste of household food all over America and taking a toll on the planet through climate change. 
But wasted food isn't just a social or humanitarian concern, it's an environmental one. Here's some food for thought. When we waste food, we also waste all the energy, the water it takes to grow it, harvest it, transport, and package it. Most people don't really realize that. Um, I definitely didn't know that, but I learned that. Um, and if food goes to the landfill and rots, it produces methane, which is a greenhouse gas, even more potent than carbon dioxide. About 11% of all the greenhouse gas emissions that come from the food system could be reduced if we stopped wasting food. In the U.S. alone, the production of lost or wasted food generates the equivalent of 37 million cars worth of greenhouse gas emissions. Expiration dates in America were made to certify peak quality and not necessarily food safety. The FDA only requires baby formula to have an expiration date and everything else is subjective. Most companies actually just put their own dates on their packaging, but those are all still skewed. They're more concerned about, pe about people buying as much as possible for the company to benefit, so the dates are almost always twisted so the consumer buys more often and thinks their food isn't safe to eat anymore. <clears throat> Microbes, which cause food to taste and smell bad, usually show up before pathogens, which means that food is likely to become showing unappetizing signs before it really makes you sick. Uh, my goal is to inform as many people about food waste at home and the signs to look for when food is going bad instead of reading the expiration date. While thinking this issue through, I knew I had to try and change the way we as consumers think while reading expiration and sell-by dates. Most of us probably throw out food that is labeled expired without giving much thought about it at all. Um, this sort of thinking is what leads to a lot of food being thrown away daily. During my research, I found that most food is still edible way past the date label and a lot of it can be stored in certain ways to prolong the shelf life, actually. I thought to myself for a while while trying to figure out the best way to display the information graphically. Oops. Okay, so these are my first sketches. Um, I decided to go a poster route to display my information that could be put discreetly on the inside of cupboards or on the fridge um, that would be comprised of more accurate dates for a lot of foods that I was um, gaining a lot of information for. I wanted the information to be in the kitchen where we waste the most. The idea that the posters would be seen daily when opening the fridge or cupboard and the consumer would become aware and notice them enough to the point where they wouldn't be like shoved into a junk drawer and not be used at all. The problems I ran to um, with these posters is um, not these specifically, but when I was making the posters, is that all cupboards come in different shapes and sizes depending on the kitchen. While a standard size sheet of paper may fit into most cupboards, it doesn't fit them all and inclusivity is important to me. So what I eventually did was I made each poster into modular columns that would be perforated um, so a consumer could just tear off a column and place it wherever they wanted to so it could fit their needs. And um, under this slide, I was just looking at the cupboard sizes, and then those are like my first sketches when I first started the project. Um, these were before the final. And then here's the first two of the final posters. There's six in total, one for each food group. They're based off of an eight and a half by 11 standard sheet of paper, but two food groups had almost twice as much information as others, so I had to add a column to those, which are the dairy here and um, the vegetable poster. But they're perforated, so each column can be torn off if needed to fit on any surface. And at the top of each poster, um, there's a large header that describes the type of food that's listed in each one, and then they're split into the subcategories. A big part of the user experience when reading these posters was figuring out how to note where the food is stored and if it's opened or not because expiration can change drastically depending on these factors. So to solve this, I created an icon system that would simplify the amount of text on the poster and make it easier on the user. On the left are my sketches of potential icons, and on the right are the final ones I chose to be at the top of each poster as a key for reference. Each one fits into a snug square bounding box so they can be easily stacked when placed next to text on the posters, as I'll show you guys in the next slide. Um, the coloring of these also changes depending on the color system of that given poster. So here's a couple of them mocked up. As you can tell at the top, um, there's the, the icons for reference um, and then them being used in the posters close up. My goal was the less text, the less cluttered the posters would feel. So that's why I made this um, little key at the top of every single one of them. 
Here's an example of how the posters would be used on a fridge on the left if you put it on a fridge. And then on the right is an example of if you would tear off certain columns um, for smaller cupboards like those ones and how they can fit into them. Once I made these posters, I knew I wanted to still include tips on how to store your produce for the longest shelf life possible. So I compiled a list of foods that spoil the quickest um, that the average American might purchase, and I researched the best way to store each of them since I already had posters. I decided to create something smaller that could fit in your hand easily. So what I ended up coming up with was 29 cards, each the size of a standard card in the deck, that would be attached on a keychain through a small hole at the top of each one. This way, the cards could have multiple places um, to live in the kitchen. They're also alphabeticized and referenced by a wash of color with graphics on each that are related to that type of food so that the consumer doesn't have to search tirelessly looking for the right one. They could be hung on a hook, um, as in the right there, placed um, in a small drawer for reference, really anywhere that the user would want them to be. And then here's just like a close up as well of the cards and the illustrations I made for those. And then the last part of my package includes two types of stickers, one for food that doesn't have an expiration date. Uh, those are the green ones. And then the red ones are for the consumer to place on food that will be going bad soon to remind them to use that first. As a waste reducer, the stickers will be made out of a reusable material so that when you're done using it, you can place it um, either back on that sticker sheet or on another item. And then to wrap all the products together, I designed a package that would hold each item. Here's some sketches on the left of when I was designing the cover of it. And on the right is the final one that I came up with. I wanted to create a catch phrase that would grab your attention and hint at what was inside. The title I landed on was Taste Not Waste to encourage everyone to spend more time literally tasting the food instead of wasting it. I incorporated references of barcodes into the title as well as treated the type kind of like a code, um, just like how confusing expiration dates are. I kind of wanted to treat the type in the same way. And after experimenting with all the different um, designs for the cover box, there's the final one there. Here's the outside of the box that would open up to a short statement about the issue in society so that the user can fully understand the problem and want to be involved. I kept the front simple when choosing the cover and then wrapped the sides of it in some of the graphic images of food that are used um, on the posters and on the inside of the box and everything. Sorry about the quality of that image. I don't know why it looked like that. <laughs> um, once opened, I've included a sheet that describes how to use the items in detail um, that are placed on top of everything. So it's the first thing that you'd see and the user would pick it up and read about everything before they dive in so that they're not confused. And then here is a layout of everything included in total. Overall, I'd like to say that I hope this product would help out others in trying to reduce their food waste footprint in this world. The consumers are at the core of this concern, so let's try sol to solve it starting there. Let's together fight food waste, more tasting and less wasting. And thank you everyone for listening. Yay, all right. I apologize for the quality of some of the images. I didn't know they would look like that. Great job, Carolyn. Uh, do we have questions? For Carolyn. Do you have a favorite uh, food card or one that you're just like super proud of? Um, yeah, probably. Let me share my screen. <laughs> that was probably my favorite part about the project was making those cards. Um, uh, See, I really liked the ginger one for some reason. This one here. It took a while to get all to look like they were in the same like palette, <laughs> like shape palette and everything. What were some resources that you went to when you're in the research process? 
Um, I spent a lot of time on this website called Eat By Day. Um, it actually gave me most of the information that's used on the posters. Uh, as far as like food storage, I was watching videos on YouTube of like the way that people store their food. And I started to do some of the things and I really noticed a difference, which is crazy. Like I started um, putting my lettuce like wrapped in paper towels and now it lasts like three weeks, <laughs> which is insane, but really does does help. I love how much research you put into like actually having it fit into the different size cupboards and like assessing all the different issues that go along with like food waste. And I think you did a really good job executing that. Thank you. Definitely. I spent a lot of time researching and figuring out the size. Um, it was actually Ryan's idea to make the columns modular. So props to him for that. <laughs> Oh, great job. Thank you, Carolyn. So last we have Maddie. Hi. All right, let me share my screen. Everyone can see that okay? Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, my name is Madeline, and for my thesis project, I designed a learning tool for teachers to give educators um, a way to teach their colleagues about dyslexia. So what is dyslexia? Um, in Latin, dyslexic is um, difficulty with language. Um, it's a difficulty with processing phonemes, but it's more than just uh, challenges with reading and writing. Um, the brain processes information differently, and it uses different pathways than a neurotypical person. You can see in um, orange over here is a neurotypical person reading and what happens in their brain. And um, the blue is um, a dyslexic man reading. Um, I myself am, am dyslexic. And for example, more than just like reading encompasses, um, I struggle with putting my thoughts um, in the right order. So this presentation was a challenge, um, but it affects uh, 20 percent of the world's population that's 65 million americans yet teachers don't learn about it or even know what the signs are and in my experience as an army brat and moving around um, all across the country and um, being a part of multiple school districts i found that teachers still often believe stereotypes of what dyslexia is um, also many states don't recognize dyslexia um, and currently there are no laws in michigan yet but there's one currently on the floor however it does not say the word dyslexia and also in many states with laws they don't say dyslexia in the law instead they call it specific learning disability but you can't really help what anything if you don't know what um, you need help with so when thinking about um, what i was going to create to address this problem um, i thought of style sheets creating a book um, animation and early on i talked with my high school teacher Mr. Cronin, who's um, an English teacher, and he's also dyslexic, and he informed me of personal development days where teachers come in and they teach their peers about anything they want, one of the topics being special education. And looking at other designs um, that already existed, I felt like they were really busy and wordy, and um, which is problematic for someone who's also dyslexic, and um, not very um, aesthetically pleasing, kind of drab. Um, this one animation, this TED ad was okay. I found it kind of boring. Um, and it didn't really, none of these things really address the strengths that dyslexics have. And they have so many strengths um, despite their challenges. Um, and they also don't address the problem of teachers. I also um, joined a bunch of Facebook communities um, and I felt like it gave me a better look at um, what challenges dyslexics have. Um, even though I am dyslexic, it is a spectrum, and so everyone has struggles with uh, different things. And I also felt like it validated a lot of my own experience. Um, another group that I joined was this dyslexic um, art community, and it really inspired me 
um, aesthetic wise and also just looking at the design that's out there. I feel like right now there's more of a push for incorporating physical things, at least with what I'm seeing on um, my Instagram pages. And I really just am drawn to when designers incorporate more physical aspects into their work. Um, and also with COVID and being on a screen, not being able to touch things, I wanted to um, also draw to that. And with um, pro the program like Orton Gillingham, which is a multi-sensory based um, program that's designed um, for dyslexics. And I also researched more about multi-sensory learning and it just better reinforces um, what it learning, what you're learning in your brain. It more solidifies that. And uh, dyslexic children, when they're taught uh, the alphabet, one helpful tool is to create the letters in clay. So they're actually like um, recognizing it and can match the sounds to it better. And so I actually ended up making my own clay. Um, it didn't work out. It was really sticky and hard to work with and I couldn't manipulate it in the way that I wanted. Um, and also the multi-sensory based learning really um, solidified me choosing to do an animation because they're both um, visual and audio. So you have multi-sensory right there. And this is a, a early storyboard I created. Doing it on sticky notes really allowed me to change and play around with what I wanted because again, organizing thoughts a little challenging. And uh, this is uh, my script. I have, feel like I have about like 10 or 12 different versions of this that I kept re-editing and revising to get exactly what I want. And so I began drawing um, and creating sketches and textures um, and then creating different stills that I would thought I would be taking into After Effects um, and manipulating in there, but I ended up really using Premiere Pro um, and as well as After Effects and Bridge and a little bit of iMovie and um, Media Encoder, um, but not just to like export the files, but to really like size down the files. Um, so I just played around with like watercolor um, and trying to mix the digital and the physical together, but I felt like it wasn't working and it was really, uh, it made me feel uncomfortable. I did not like the aesthetic. So I decided I needed to do everything hands-on, which that meant I needed to make a stop motion. Um, and this is kind of the setup I had, the lighting real that I had, um, one silhouette to kind of cascade it really gave this nice shadow effect that I felt gave it more depth and texture like you wanted to like reach out and touch it which is what I was going for um these are some beginning um animations that I did um and so I drew everything by hand and then I took it to the xeroxer and I copied it and I cut all of that out with an exacto knife so a very long process. Um, and then in choosing my typeface, um, I looked at so many different typefaces and I really didn't like how um, uh, originally I was gonna do lowercase, um, but I really didn't like how the uh, A is a two-story A um, and most sans serifs. And um, so I just uh, chose to do a bold Future, I felt like this was easier to cut out looking at the negative shapes in the spaces. Um, cutting this out was easier for what I was going to be doing. Um, this is part of uh, an early uh, rendition of my stop motion. And I really just felt that, like, as designers, it's not only just we're trying to solve a problem, but trying to figure out how to tell the story and figuring out the best way to do that. And I think uh, stop motion ended up being the best way. Um, and I had a really good conversation with Paul Sizer about it and um, just trying to embrace the, embrace the punk aspect of design. Um, these are all my parcels that I made for my um, stop motion, um, all of my hand-drawn elements and some brief mock-ups that I made before I just decided to make my own. Um, and then I chose purple because purple is like the world national color for dyslexia. Um, so without further ado, here's my website. Um, so you'd go through and you click, um, it doesn't matter which order you watch them in. I feel like you all get the same content no matter what. Ready? Let me uh, stop sharing real quick and just make sure I'm sharing for optimized video. Um, 
All right. Reading is complex. It is not a hardwired form of human communication. It requires our brains to connect and match letters to sound and then put those sounds in the right order to form words. Dyslexics have trouble processing phonemes or pairing sounds to the right letter form. There is no one control center in the brain that is responsible for reading. Instead, multiple parts are involved. The dyslexic way of thinking and processing balances its counterpart neurotypical thinking. There is nothing wrong with the dyslexic brain. The problem is how school systems teach everyone the same when there are many different ways to learn. Dyslexic brains are a natural occurrence. Approximately one in five people or six out of 30 in a classroom, 20% will have dyslexia. I also feel like my aspect ratio um, contributes to the overall aesthetic of what I was trying to dyslexia go for. Dyslexia has a combination of strengths. A few are problem solving, creativity, and critical thinking. And challenges with reading, writing, and spelling, working memory, and time management. Each dyslexic will have a different combination and pattern of these strengths and challenges. Some people even attribute their success to dyslexia. And without the dyslexic way of thinking, we wouldn't have phones or light bulbs. Identifying these strengths and challenges is key to the success in education and in the future. Placing more importance on the strengths will help the dyslexic student flourish. Dyslexia is not reading backwards or behavioral problems. It is an information processing problem. Sometimes dyslexia mimics the signs of ADD or ADHD, which are also non-neurotypical disorders and sometimes they're paired together. Typically have poor executive function skills like a messy desk and become easily frustrated and daydream a lot, which has the appearance of not paying attention. These are all signs of dyslexia that can appear behavioral. And telling a child to sound out an unknown word won't work. Instead, they'll continue to memorize the shape of the word and use pictures as context clues. Multisensory based learning, like the orton gillingham approach, is the best way to teach not only dyslexic students, but the majority of other people retain more information through multisensory learning. And then the last video real quick. Here are some things you can do as a teacher. Be familiar with the signs. Smart, but can't spell. Spelling is one of the classic red flags alerting parents and teachers to a serious underlying problem. Spelling things phonetically, misspelling basic sight words, and not being able to match sounds with the right letters. They also struggle with multi-step directions, sequencing. Up, down, left, right, one, two, three, ABC, handwriting, and putting thoughts on paper, executive function skills like organizing and staying on task. Orton Gillingham is a must for primary grade teachers and is designed for dyslexics because they will never outgrow dyslexia. But with the right support from teachers like you who are willing to continue to learn about dyslexia, advocate for your students to get accommodations they need, and be unstoppable. If you can't get training, try adding multi-sensory learning to your lesson plan. It won't just benefit dyslexic kids, but the whole classroom. And I also have a link for resources um, if you want to go uh, sign up to get trained for in Gillingham or um, just um, in general. Um, oh, not the right tab, but just in general um, for other like references uh, for my cited sources in there too. And then I'd really love to continue this project farther. Um, I made like surveys to take before and after, but design-wise, I'd really like to um, work with um, other designers who know how to code to um, make mock-ups, because ideally I would like to use um, UX design and um, have pop-ups come up um, before you would click on the video and then a pop-up would come up and you'd have to answer the question. And it's kind of more enforcing the multi-sensory learning, because this would be more social learning um, with your peers. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I really hope that you learned something about dyslexia.
Great job, Maddie. Do we have questions for Maddie? How many photos would you say was in each stop motion? Um, I think anywhere. So the shortest one I have is like 40 seconds. And I think maybe that's like 600 photos. <laughs> I know the one when they get up to a minute, it's almost like a thousand. Photos yeah. per, oh my gosh. So it's, it's yeah, quite a few. <laughs> really good. I really Thank liked you. it. Yeah, I love that one too. My friend. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I also felt like the glitchy aspect that I have in my video, which was a total accident, but then I figured out what I did and was able to like continue to do it. I feel like that kind of also illustrates um, what dyslexia is and like what you're seeing for people who have it. Very nice. It's very good. Also, Carolyn, I didn't get to say anything after yours. I, I started, I just had so much I was trying to do, but I think it's really nice to see all of you and the work is great. And I'm so proud of all of you because you just in this whole time we've had COVID, you've been, you guys have been able to like bring it right to the plate and do it and go for it. And that's great because you can get during those times, people, some people can get a little bit like nervous or bored or like not knowing what to do and you're not all together all the time anymore so i don't know how much you've been all together lately but yeah so anyway it was great to see everyone and um ryan you've done a really great job with them so thank you thanks trish Yeah, even though I've been uh, lurking, uh, I've listened to every single one and viewed as many as I can and excellent, excellent work. All the hard work that I've seen you guys doing um, late nights, um, skulking around the design center of the BFA studio, absolutely paid off. Well, well, uh, well put. Yeah, I spent a lot of nights here. It shows, these were all fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, great, great work, everybody. Um, it's, it's been a good semester in, yeah, in a lot of ways, even though it's been challenging in a lot of ways. So, um, and thank you everyone for coming and supporting our senior students and uh, watching their presentations and for your comments and for taking the time to uh, be here. Um, I really appreciate, appreciate that. I'm sure they do as well. So, um, so, um, thanks everybody. Um, yes, this is it for this year. So. Another I have one request. Oh, yeah. Can I make a request? Um, all of you, I hope you'll still be using your WMISH.edu emails because I, at time, I'm going to communicate some things back to you or if I find things that look like they're a good fit for you or things like that, I would like to be able uh, to know that you still keep that. I always say that at the end of every year, most people do, but you know what I mean? Okay, great. You're good. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. My, uh, my afternoon class. I know you guys Very are all awesome. zoomed out, but we've got a, an alumni meeting us at two. So be punctual and we'll keep it light and short. So see you guys at two. What's an alumni meeting? <laughs> Uh, Maggie is going to come. What is it? Uh, Maggie from last year. Oh, so, okay, got yeah. it. We've just I been bringing in some people and like talking to them about what you got to work and stuff. Yeah, I thought you might be kicking them out already. Okay, no, no, no they're almost alumni, not yet. <laughs> See you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.